Okay, we are live, Mr. Mayor. Thank you very much. Um, it is uh, on or about 6.30. I'll call this land use planning meeting to order by formally recognizing that we are meeting on Aboriginal land that has been inhabited by Indigenous peoples from the beginning. As settlers, we're grateful for the opportunity to be good stewards of this land and thank all of the generations of people who have taken care of this place for thousands of years. In particular, we acknowledge the proud heritage of our neighbours from the Alderville First Nation and the Mohawks of the Bay of Quinney. I will also advise that due to the provincial state of emergency and stay at home orders, this meeting will be held using electronic conference technology. Staff, council and participants in the statutory public meeting are all joining the meeting electronically. The public is invited to join us by viewing this meeting live on the municipality of Brighton YouTube channel. Move into the approval of the agenda. And I have had a request from Councilor LeBlanc. So the, most, the first motion reads that council add legacy planning consent matters under number seven unfinished business that will be moved by Councilor LeBlanc. And I'll ask if there's a seconder. Seconded by Mark, uh, Councilor Bateman. Is there any discussion? Councilor Rowley? Thank you. Could you just uh, repeat some of that, please? And um, yeah, I'm just not quite clear as to what that was. So I'll give you a, a very brief background because we don't want to get into discussing the item exactly. until we get into discussing the item, but it's legacy planning consent matters and it will be under unfinished business. Uh, and it's just some concerns that uh, have been offered to uh, Council LeBlanc with regard to uh, some consent matters that may or may not have come forward through the planning department um, because of various things that have happened in the past. Uh, we're not going to get into a discussion and I've, I've asked Council LeBlanc to avoid discussion around uh, particular staff members or particular consent matters. <clears throat> It'll be a very quick discussion and likely a referral to staff for more information. Deputy Mayor. Uh, thank you. Um, I don't like things like this being added at the last minute because I've had no plan, no time to plan for it. I don't know what it's concerning. Um, is there any kind of report we can refer to? Is this something we've discussed in the past? Is there something that just so I have an idea what we're what we're adding at the last minute to an agenda, which we're not supposed to do without. Right. So the it's I think there's a, a number, uh, and I think the number is around seven uh, consent matters that may may not have come to council, or in some cases may have come to the past council, that um, may uh, some some may want to uh, revisit. Um, we won't prosecute those this evening. Uh, as I say, um, we'll give Councillor LeBlanc a few moments to uh, discuss the matter and then likely we'll refer the matter to staff so that we can get a report to come forward. But without doing that, we can't get a report to come forward. So yeah. fair enough. So is any further discussion? All in favor? Oh, sorry, Madam Clerk, <laughs> please call the vote. <laughs> Uh, members of council, please unmute yourselves. Can you tell me who's second? Councillor Bateman. Okay, Councillor Ron Anderson. Uh, yes. Councillor Mark Bateman. Yes. Councillor Doug LeBlanc. Yes. Councillor Emily Rowley. Yes. Councillor Mary Tadman. Yes. Deputy Mayor Laura Vink, you're muted. Yes. Thank you. That wasn't muted. Mayor Brian Alexander? Yes. We're carried. So the next motion reads that Council approve the February 8th, 2021 planning meeting agenda as amended. Is there a mover? So moved. Thank you. Seconder? Was moved by Councillor Tadman, seconded by Councillor Rowley. Is there any discussion? Madam Clerk, please call the vote. Councillor Ron Anderson? Yes. Councillor Mark Bateman? Yes. Councillor Doug LeBlanc? Yes. Councillor Emily Rowley? Yes. Councillor Mary Tadman? Yes, that says amended, correct, Mayor? Amended. Okay, thanks. 
Deputy Mayor Laura Bank. Are you muted? She's not muted. For some reason, Laura, when you say yes, it doesn't pick up your voice right away. So I'm not sure how to solve that problem. <laughs> yes. There it is. There we go. That's better. And I made it enough. I won't be so emphatic, but yes. Thank you. Okay, Terry. Thank you. Uh, members of council, do you have any declarations of pecuniary interest? And if so, please state the general nature thereof. Councillor LeBlanc? Yes, I have a conflict of interest on a 5.4 because it's my neighbor. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Tadman. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I would like to declare uh, a pecuniary interest in uh, 5.2 and uh, the bylaw, no, the next one would be 5.3 and uh, then the bylaw that follows that is 8.1. Um, Uh, Councillor LeBlanc, um, I don't, I don't wish to coach anyone with regard to their conflicts, but would you also be declaring on 8.2, which is the bylaw with regard to the same land use planning matter? Yes, and I'll, and while this is going on, I will also turn my video off and my sound off. I think that's wise. Any other declarations of pecuniary interest? Thank you. We have no delegations this evening, which takes us into our statutory public meeting. And I will have a motion that council move into the statutory public meeting February 8th, February 8th, 2021 at 6.38 p.m. Is there a mover? It's moved by Councillor LeBlanc, seconded by Councillor Anderson. Is there any discussion? Madam Clerk, please call the vote. Councillor Ron Anderson? Yes. Councillor Mark Bateman? Yes. Councillor Doug LeBlanc? Yes. Councillor Emily Rally? Yes. Councillor Mary Todman? Where's Mary? She's hmm. already decided she's in a conflict. Okay. Yep. Uh, Deputy Mayor Laura Vink? Yes. And Mayor Brian Astrander? Yes. Okay. Thank you. So before we move into the business in the statutory public meeting, I need to read uh, some information coming out of um, the regulations. If a person or public body does not make oral submissions at a public meeting or make written submissions to the municipality of Brighton in respect of the proposed plan of subdivision zoning bylaw amendment or consent before the approval authority gives or refuses to give approval to it, the person or public body is not entitled to appeal the decision of the municipality of Brighton to the local, to the local planning appeal tribunal. If a person or public body does not make oral submissions at a public meeting or make written submissions to the municipality of Brighton in respect of the proposed plan of subdivision, zoning bylaw amendment or consent before the approval authority gives or refuses to give approval, the person or public body may not be added as a party to the hearing of an appeal before the local planning appeal tribunal, unless in the opinion of the tribunal, there are reasonable grounds to do so. If you wish to be notified of the decision of the municipality of Brighton in respect of the proposed plan of subdivision, zoning bylaw amendment, or consent, you must make a written request to the municipal clerk, Candace Dora. And that takes us to the first item in our statutory public meeting, which is with regard to an official plan and zoning bylaw amendments uh, being part, part of lots three and four, concession one, parts one to three of plan 39R, 11840, Part 1 of Plan 39R, 9894, Part of Part 1 of Plan 39R, 10910, Part of Parts 1 to 4 of Plan 38R, 1408, and Part of Lots 29 to 31 of Registered Plan 28. And as noted, the purpose of the public meeting is to request direction from Council on an official plan amendment and zoning bylaw amendment 
for the following applications being filed, OPA 01-2019 and Z21-2019. The owners are Paul Quick Construction Limited and AMR Investments Incorporated. The applicant is RFA Planning Consultants, and I've already listed the location. Ms. Doherty, by what method and on what date was notice of the official plan amendment and zoning bylaw amendment applications given? Uh, Mr. Mayor, members of council, uh, for you, Mr. Mayor, notice of the official plan amendment and zoning bylaw amendment applications were sent by first class mail on January 18th, 2021 to all property owners within 120 meters of the subject property. Uh, notice was also circulated to all agencies as required under the Planning Act. Uh, in addition, a signed notice was also posted on the property and as well, it, notice was also published in the Brighton Independent on January 28th. Thank you, Ms. Doherty. Would you please explain the purpose and reason for the proposed official plan and zoning bylaw amendments and what they would accomplish? Through you, Mr. Mayor, the purpose and effect of the proposed official plan amendment and uh, zoning bylaw amendment is to support residential land uses on the subject property in the form of a proposed uh, plan of subdivision, which uh, an application has also been received um, by the municipality for, um, as well as a, a future condominium development. Uh, more specifically, the official plan amendment would serve to change the designation on a portion of the subject lands from community facility and open space to residential and to redesignate the balance of the subject lands to environmental protection. Uh, the zoning bylaw amendment would serve to amend the zoning on the subject lands from agricultural exception one and agricultural exception three, as well as future development. Uh, to urban residential two, um, having exception numbers 41 and 42, as well as urban residential three, having exception numbers 14 and 15, and also environmental protection. The residential zones would introduce certain site specific provisions which are intended to accommodate the uh, lot fabric as proposed in the plan of subdivision. Um, however, I would note that since circulating the notice of public meeting, uh, the applicant has uh, proposed revisions to the development site plan. Uh, these were shared as uh, attachment number seven in the report. Uh, I believe it is the intent of the applicant to present those changes to council tonight, but they are uh, somewhat different than what was circulated in the notice. Um, these revised plans um, have not been formally submitted to the municipality with supporting documentation, so uh, it has not yet had the benefit of detailed review by staff or commenting bodies. Thank you, Ms. Doherty. Appreciate that information. Um, I'm assuming, but does the owner or applicant wish to make any comments this evening? There's Ruth. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of council. Um, yes, I have a presentation and uh, joining me with the presentation is Amanda Redden from Jewel Engineering. So I believe I'm going to share the screen. Yes, this is, as Amanda uh, Doherty has explained, this is a public meeting to uh, present the Brighton Meadows subdivision and specifically the official plan amendment and rezoning that support the draft plan. It's uh, being filed on behalf of uh, Paul Quick Construction Limited and AMR Investments. Whoops. Um, the site itself is over 100 acres in size. It's outlined in green on this uh, slide um, with about 60% of the uh, property within the Brighton urban settlement boundary. The balance is outside in the rural areas. The subdivision lands themselves comprise 12.78 hectares, which is just over 30 acres. When this uh, parcel or how this parcel came to be created, I can assume was uh, as Ontario Street and Raglan Street were divided uh, along the frontages for residential lots. And there were 20 meter fingers that uh, were left remaining on those streets to provide access for future roads into these lands. The property itself is surrounded by uh, single detached residential uses on Raglan and Ontario Street. And the balance of the, of the areas are vacant or wetland and forested areas. 
the property itself is vacant with a unnamed stream cutting through the property from the north to the south. We initiated work on this project in 2018 in pre-consultation meetings with the Municipal and Lower Trent Conservation Authority staff. But I should point out that prior to this time, uh, the Paul Quicklands were actually uh, draft approved for a subdivision which lapsed. As a result of that lapsing, it was required to file a new application and uh, plans in support of, of, and reports in support of the subdivision. The applications themselves were filed in October of 2019 and then deemed complete a month later. There was a lengthy circulation period of time, uh, probably uh, um, as a result of the COVID uh, um, lockdown. And uh, in the spring and, and in May, we received comments from the review agencies through DM Wills. And we uh, established meetings at that time with the municipality and the Lower Trent Conservation Authority to review ongoing uh, concerns about the limits of the flood line and the environmentally protected areas. Um, as a result of those uh, discussions and additional reviews, a second submission was filed in November of 2020 with updated reports and plans at that time. Uh, the um, plans included the draft plan of subdivision, the official plan amendment and rezoning applications, the planning report, the flood line evaluation and preliminary stormwater management report, functional servicing report, traffic impact studies, uh, stage one and two archeological assessment and environmental impact statement. And I understand that uh, digital copies of this material is available through the municipality. We just received on January 25th, uh, additional and new comments from the municipality and agencies. And as a result of the municipal comments, we have made some revisions to the plan to try and respond to these new comments. This uh, slide shows the revised uh, draft plan of subdivision in a conceptual form. Uh, this is not part of this public meeting, but it's for information purposes this evening. Um, the new internal roadways have entrances uh, onto Ontario Street at the north and Raglan Street to the south. There are 173 units uh, proposed in total with a variety of housing forms being proposed. The majority of these are low density residential, which are shown in two shades of yellow. Um, there are semi-detached units uh, that are also considered low density housing that are shown in the paler pink color. There are 36 freehold townhouse units that are shown in the darker orange. Uh, 16 condominium units are proposed at the north limit of the property. And these would be for a variety of units ranging from singles to townhouse units. Um, all of the semi-detached and townhouse units are proposed to be one story in height. And on this drawing is in the pink is the floodway area that's drawn and has been surveyed as well as the dashed green line, which is the um, established boundary of the wetland. So all of the subdivision lands are then set back 30 meters outside of this wetland setback, and that forms the limit of development. The roadways are shown on the drawing in gray, and there will be sidewalks provided along one side of each street. This is a continuous street pattern to ensure that the entire neighborhood is permeable, and we've removed the cul-de-sac that was previously shown. The street lengths have been kept relatively short to provide a compact connected community. The design ensures opportunities for linkages with walkways that connect to the surrounding residential areas. And there is a mid uh, site pedestrian connection proposed to uh, connect to the sidewalk on the other side of Ontario Street. There are three blocks that are to be deeded to the municipality for active parks that are adjacent to the wooded area. And these are shown in dark green. Previously, we had not understood that the municipality had wanted parkland to be deeded. And so part of this revision that we are presenting tonight does show 5% of the land to be deeded for active park. The larger central park block as shown on this plan uh, has uh, access to both the north and south streets in the subdivision. I'd like to uh, now invite Amanda Redden to um, uh, discuss the various reports that Jewel Engineering prepared. 
Thanks, Ruth. Um, as Ruth said, we submitted as part of the application a traffic impact study. Um, as you can see with our revised plan, we're proposing one access from Raglan Street and an access from Ontario Street. Um, you will notice that uh, the access to Ontario Street is different from the plan that was circulated previously. That's one of our responses to the municipal comments that was received. We moved the site access on Ontario Street to the north to avoid an offset intersection with Cardinal Court on Ontario Street. Um, all of the intersections, so the new proposed site access to Ontario Street and Raglan, and as well as the Raglan and Ontario Street intersection were analyzed as part of the traffic impact study. It was found that all intersections provide safe um, access and egress from the site. There's no alterations required to existing intersection geometry or provision of turning lanes required. Um, as well, there were good sight lines found at both of the intersection locations. There would be a stop control um, at the new, inter the new subdivision access points. Next slide. Um, the site will be serviced with municipal um, sanitary and water main. The sanitary servicing will be via gravity sewers throughout the proposed development. The gravity sanitary sewers will connect to the existing 600 millimeter trunk sanitary sewer on Raglan Street um, that then continues east of Ontario and turns to a 750 trunk sewer. Um, because the sanitary um, connection point is on Raglan Street, this will form the first phase of the development Discharge from the um, proposed development consumes only three and a half percent of the capacity of that existing 600 millimeter sanitary sewer on Raglan. For water servicing of the subdivision, uh, there will be two connection points. One will connect to the existing 150 millimeter water main on Raglan Street, and the other connection point is at the intersection on Ontario Street where we will connect to the 250 millimeter water main. Uh, this will provide looping of the municipal system and reduces the existing dead end length on Raglan Street. Uh, the servicing study found there was sufficient flow and pressure in the municipal system to support the proposed development. One of the other studies submitted as part of our applications was a stormwater management report. Uh, as Ruth mentioned previously, the entire site drains west to an unnamed tributary and wetland area. Um, external drainage from around the site will be picked up in rear yard swales and conveyed to the storm sewers through the subdivision. As part of our uh, reports, we did we completed um, we completed a review of the 1991 master drainage study that was completed by TSH. Um, in that study, TSH found that development of these lands uh, did not have had an imperceptible impact on the floodplain. Therefore, they specified that no quantity control would be required when these lands were developed. As part of Jules stormwater management report, we completed we we completed the same analysis to confirm. If those we can, sorry, we completed the same analysis and came to the same conclusions as TSH that based on the current geometry of the Raglan Street crossing, there still is an imperceptible impact on the floodplain after development. Therefore, quantity controls will become redundant. Quality control, however, will be provided to level one enhanced with treatment units at the source and end of pipe units such as oil grit separators. Um, these recommendations are in accordance with the recommendations of the 2019 Brighton Stormwater Master Plan. Major flows throughout the subdivision will go over the roads and through um, stormwater blocks and park blocks out to the Western unnamed tributary. Part of the stormwater management report was a floodline evaluation completed. Uh, Ruth touched on this previously as well. 
This is the TSH 1991 Master Drainage Study, which I had mentioned already recommended or supported development of these lands. Um, they recommended a two zone approach be applied here. So no development should be permitted within the flood way, but filling would be permitted within the flood, flood fringe. Um, this approach was adopted in the Brighton OP and our proposed development follows those recommendations. So we completed an updated floodway delineation uh, to reflect the current Raglan Street crossing geometry and have maintained all of the development lands outside of the floodway. The floodway lands will be designated as EP and fill will be placed, you can see it here in the um, hatched area in the flood fringe area to provide flood proofing. Uh, as Eotis Natural Heritage Consultants completed an environmental impact statement to support the subdivision application, um, they delineated the wetland and applied a 30 meter setback from the wetland. All development is maintained outside of this 30 meter setback. So there is a buffer of undisturbed naturalized area to, pr to protect the wetland. Um, as Eotis found there's no loss to fish habitat provincially significant wetland or unevaluated wetland. Um, as part of the project, a significant portion of the lands are wooded areas. You can see here outlined in black, there's an existing woodland area linked to over 217 hectares of woodlands. Um, part in the environmental impact statement, we designated this the Brighton Woodland System. It's considered significant under the NHRM criteria. Um, about 3.1 hectares of conif coniferous forest um, is identified in the pink on kind of the right side of the plan there. That's the area of forest that would be impacted by the development proposal. Um, it's important to note that this is coniferous forest and it does not contain any um, interior woodland because of the shape of it. Um, the to comp we've proposed a compensation plan, which is what you're seeing here. So the red areas is the woodland that would be removed and the green areas are areas that would, we, were, we would reestablish woodland. So it would extend the integrity of the interior forest and forest habitat. Um, as well, you notice with our revised plan, we've located the park um, in that wooded area to lessen the impact of tree removal required. Thanks, Amanda. Um, I just wanted to uh, follow up a little bit more on the environmental protection areas, um, just to reiterate some of what Amanda has said. The floodway hazard lands adjacent to the creek have been surveyed extensively, and these are regulated and controlled by the Conservation Authority. No development is proposed at all within the floodway. To protect the features and functions of the wetland and to pr protect private property from any of the flood hazards, the floodway, the wetland, and the 30 meter setback buffer area will be zoned environmental protection through these applications. And all of the building lots are outside of these um, protected areas. The adjacent sensitive lands that constitute over 50% of the land holding will not be developed. Within the 30 meter buffer setback area, there is the possibility that this may be used for trails by the public. Uh, depending on, on how the municipality wishes to uh, consider these areas. Turn very briefly to some of the uh, provincial and, and county and local plans and the policies. Um, the proposed subdivision is within the Brighton urban area, which is to be the focus of growth and development according to the provincial plans. Provided that there is sufficient municipal servicing available, which there is, that can be extended to service the site. Brighton Meadows is the logical progression of the existing neighborhoods that front onto Ontario Street and Raglan Street. And there was allowance and provision for those neighborhoods to be extended through the configuration of the property. Development is to provide a range of housing forms and densities to provide compact form and efficient use of land and infrastructure. A significant portion, as I've mentioned, of the property within the Brighton urban area will be preserved as an environmental natural heritage feature with the wooded areas, flood and stormwater controls. 
The lands are designated urban area on Schedule A of the County of Northumberland Official Plan, and these areas are to be the focus for population growth in the county. Brighton Meadows is, is a logical extension of the existing built boundary in Brighton, according to the county plan. There's been an assessment of the uh, targets in the county plan to ensure that the population density target of 25 people per gross hectare is satisfied. And the proposal um, conforms to all of the policies of the county official plan. The slide shows the extract from the land use plan of the Brighton Urban Area Schedule A Map 2, which is proposed to be amended. The lands are within the Brighton Urban Settlement Boundary, and they're immediately adjacent to the intensification boundary, which is shown in red, and the subject land is shown in blue. Adjacent to these lands, shown in yellow in the Brighton Official Plan, to the north, south, and east are all residential. The lands have a variety of land use designations, residential, community facilities and open space, environmental protection, green fields, and a special policy overlay shown in Hatch. And it's the darker green community facilities and open space, which is the primary subject to this official plan amendment. This slide shows the proposed official plan amendment to the Brighton Urban Area Schedule A Map 2, and it's intended to redesignate the lands from community facilities and open space to residential as shown in the area in orange. This particular designation that was dark green on the previous slide is the only community facility designation in the Brighton official plan. As community facilities are actually permitted in all official plan land use designations. There's been no identified community facility use for this property, nor is this property held in public ownership. The official plan amendment will also reflect the detailed surveys of wetland and floodline boundaries and associated setbacks. The residential land use designation that is proposed is appropriate. The planning report reviews the official plan policies of the Brighton um, uh, with respect to residential. And the official plan promotes a variety of housing forms to enhance housing affordability, respond to market conditions, and provide for an efficient compact built form consistent with the provincial policy statement. Overall, this subdivision provides primarily low density housing with both freehold and condominium forms of ownership, but it does satisfy the density targets that are set out in the official plan policies. It's adjacent to the built up area of Brighton where services can be extended and are available. The predominant housing form is single and semis, making up 70% of the overall subdivision units. And the overall density is 20 units per net hectare or 13 units per gross hectare. So a blend of housing types will be provided arranged in a progression. The subdivision proposal includes a mix of housing types. The inclusion of the singles and semi-detached units reflect the character of the existing low density development along Ontario Raglan Street while the integration of townhouses addresses the intensification policies of the official plan. The adjacent residential properties, as I've mentioned, on Ontario and Raglan Street are single detached residential units. This subdivision has been designed to provide a variety of housing forms within the low density limits of the official plan and to be compatible with adjacent uses through the construction of low profile buildings, fencing, landscaping and setbacks. The density does increase slightly towards the center of the site away from the existing detached homes. Single detached units will primarily abut existing low density housing on the periphery. And the semi-detached units in the townhouses will all be low profile or single story to assist in maintaining privacy and avoiding overlook. There is a condominium block proposed at the northern limit of the subdivision, and it is shown here, uh, the photograph on the top of the slide, as well as the uh, extract from the development site plan. Um, it's adjacent to the EP uh, zone, our existing forest, which is to be preserved. And it fronts on the internal, um, it would have an internal driveway that would front onto Street A and the park block. It has the potential to connect to northern vacant lands um, and it will be separated from the existing single unit dwellings with fencing and landscaping as well as its own internal private 
amenity blocks for open space. The zoning that's proposed would permit a maximum of 16 single semi or bungalow townhouse units, and the density would be within the low density range. This slide shows the updated rezoning schedule. And as mentioned by Amanda Doherty, there's a proposal to rezone the A1, A3 and FD zone to a variety of zones as follows. The predominant uh, two zones would be, first of all, the R2-X zone, which would have special provisions. And it's shown in the orange color. And this would permit the single and semi-detached units. It would have special setbacks from the environmental protection zone and provisions related to lot frontage and, and the uh, maximum lot coverage. The urban residential R4 zone is the zone that permits townhouses in the Brighton zoning bylaw. So the area shown in brown would permit the freehold townhouse units and be limited to single story only. The condominium lands would have a special proposed R4 zoning that in addition to the townhouses would also permit singles or semi-detached units. The park blocks are proposed to be zoned uh, open space and they're shown in the, in the darker green tone on the, on the schedule. And finally, the environmental protection zone uh, that's uh, proposed to recognize the wetlands and the 30 meter buffer and flood, flood lay, floodway would, uh, is shown in the lighter green and this zone also permits public trails. Just like to summarize uh, that the Brighton Meadows subdivision has been through a, a two plus year planning review process. This public meeting pertains to the official plan amendment and rezoning applications. The official plan amendment would redesignate the lands from the community facilities designation to a residential land use designation and would tie in with the balance of the residentially designated property. The rezoning would be to permit various housing forms and the park blocks. The development plan consists of 173 units with 86 single detached, 34 semi-detached, 36 town units and 16 condominium units. All development in the subdivision would occur beyond a 30 meter setback for the environmental protection of the natural features and for flood control. The approvals conform to the provincial policies and the updated Brighton official plan policies. The subdivision design and these planning documents will be brought back following a detailed review from all of the municipal uh, departments as well as from the public this evening. And that concludes our presentation, but uh, we'd be pleased to um, answer any of your questions. Thank you both for uh, the detailed presentation and the, uh, I guess the updates uh, as mentioned by Ms. Doherty um, that have not been contemplated by, uh, by our staff, I understand, or by our, our consultant staff. Uh, so I'll ask if there are persons present or <laughs> virtually present, if you will, uh, who have questions or comments regarding the proposed official plan amendment and zoning bylaw amendment applications. Yes, I'm present here. And who, who is it that I'm speaking to? Uh, Paul Coombs. Hi, Paul. Go ahead and ask your question or make your comment. Okay, um, I first of all would like to thank the council, council for the opportunity to speak. I, I assume you have my statements, statement and pictures on file for the proposal to zone this area as a subdivision. There will be many changes that may not have been the case when the area was considered farmland. Now the area will have added challenges while it's being built now and while it's being built now in the time after. I, I have uh, two specific questions um, and also a comment that uh, I, I, I thought the presentation was excellent. However, um, the documentation that I received uh, in, um, in November of last year and the documentation that I re received a couple of weeks ago uh, does not include any any information about uh, the um, the proposal for the sewers and 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 all the information about uh, it being a swamp and and how they're going to deal with that problem so I'd like some information about um, where I can get that information 
Um, also, another comment is that the, on Raglan, there's actually on the eastern part of Raglan where it meets Ontario, there's actually only two units or three units that have sewers. The rest of us are on septic. Um, but back to my two specific questions were what measures are going to be taken uh, during construction to prevent flooding on my land? Because as I said, if anyone has reviewed my pictures, it clearly shows that this area is flooding my land, but the excuse before was it's farmland. Um, and the second one is what measures are going to be put in place after construction to prevent flooding on, on my land. Um, as I, and so uh, that's sort of the end of uh, uh, my presentation. Um, thank you again for the opportunity. Thank you, Mr. Coombs. And uh, before we, as council, uh, read a motion, there will be opportunity for both our consultant and for the, uh, the uh, proponents consultant to uh, answer these questions. So I, I saw both uh, making notes and would, will anticipate that they'll want to answer the questions uh, as, as they're able to before council reads its motion. Thank you. Thank you. And who, who's next from the public? Doug Vowles, if I may. Go ahead, Doug. Uh, we live at 183 Ontario Street. Um, so we noticed that last summer's excavation and earth movement activities resulted in a lot of dirt being deposited on our Ontario Street. Uh, we live 150 feet north of the current, what we see is the current construction access now with the modification presented tonight, this may all become moot as far as our driveway is concerned. But that access um, meant that when trucks came out, um, us living on where we are, the road grade here meant that a lot of dirt and grit was deposited at the foot of our driveway, tracked up the driveway by tire, foot, et cetera. I took away a full wheelbarrow full of dirt that I shoveled off the bottom of the driveway at one point from construction trucks going by. So I've got a couple of questions. Um, this may not apply to us specifically if the site plan has been changed and that's accepted, but it would apply to my neighbors further north up the street. Um, what restrictions are there on construction companies shedding dirt on the road? That's one. What mitigating efforts can they or the municipality be obliged to do to keep the road clear? And Ultimately, when will enough subdivision internal roads be paved such that most dirt will be shed before the trucks hit Ontario Street? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Vowles. And again, uh, both, uh, both the planning consultant for the municipality and for the proponent will be able to answer those questions. Um, but very quickly, once a subdivision agreement is completed between the municipality and the uh, the corporation doing the build out, there are always, um, we're, there's always wording in those agreements about uh, making sure the roads are cleaned. And um, especially lately, our staff have been very good at uh, ensuring that developers are, are adhering to those rules. So uh, I would anticipate that we would see that wording in a future subdivision agreement um, should that, should this proposal move forward. Um, and uh, therefore the, the proponent would be um, uh, obligated to, to ensure that streets were cleaned on an ongoing basis if they were to deposit mud and dirt onto uh, public roadways or you know, even, even private driveways for that matter um, as, as the development built out. But I'll, I'll let the two consultants speak to that as well. Is there anyone else present who wishes to speak to this application? Before I move on, uh, I'll ask the deputy clerk if he's aware if there's anyone else coming in for this purpose. Uh, I don't believe so, um, but uh, I might just ask uh, the clerk if you if you know if John is uh, was planning to speak to this item. Um, looks like he's having some trouble connecting to his audio, so I'm not sure if he is planning to speak to this item. 
We've got John's iPad Pro, Candice. Do you know if that's someone who registered to speak to this? No, I don't. So there's a, yeah, John Mullen. Um, that could be who that is. And it is for this particular item. So yes. So he, he, it does look like it's having trouble connecting. It's endeavoring to connect now to the audio. Um, so John, if you can hear us, I'm gonna move on in the, um, in the statutory public meeting, but if you're able to connect, um, please make yourself known and we'll come back to you so you can at, offer your comments and or questions. Um, also, did, um, Madam Clerk, did, did uh, John, provide written comments? No. Do you, uh, do you have an email that you can correspond with him at? So he's going to provide his written comments after, after this meeting. He's just told you that? I, I got an email here that says um, written comments I re responded to him telling him that he could give those to us after the meeting. Perfect. Thank you. I, I know this, this format can be incredibly frustrating if you have connectivity issues. So uh, our apologies to John and we look forward to receiving his comments uh, through email. He does not plan on participating. He just wanted to view. Uh, very well. Thank you. Okay. So I'll ask if there are any questions from members of council, uh, keeping in mind that um, the intention will be to uh, the, the motion will read that we are returning this uh, back to staff uh, to be brought forward at a future time with uh, a subdivision agreement. So, uh, but members of council, any questions or comments? Councilor LeBlanc? Uh, the chair, the mayor, I have uh, several questions. So, uh, we'll do one at a time because yeah. you're not the only one. I know. One of the uh, questions I have, which was passed on to me by a resident, was in the study, was the drooping trillium and the trillium flex uh, looked at in the endangered under the Ontario Endangered Species Act that are present here on this property? Was that taken into consideration? Okay, so again, uh, same comments as to the, the public. We'll get the consultants to speak to that when it's their turn to answer or to uh, provide final comments. Okay. okay. All right. Question two. I when I look at the, when I look at the, uh, the subdivision, I do not see I do not see a stormwater management pond. Basically, for a hundred year event or a Timmins event, but I also see that they've adopted the TSH study, which I kind of like that they're using it in there. When I read the third question, are they using the roadway? as a conduit for stormwater management to bring the water to the, um, to, the, uh, the, to, the, to the unnamed creek. Thirdly, there, are they approving, are, they, are we passing the one, are we sending for, for more comments for the 173 homes, uh, buildings, or just 148? Because there's still one lot to be developed. I don't know why we're not developing it. My comments are we should develop it all as one. Three or four, and this is to be fairness, is there 40, is there 40 meters attaching itself to a municipal road for doing the, sub, the subdivision agreement like I required for any other lots or attachments? Okay. Fourthly, fifthly, The, the, the distance between homes under uh, the, um, the Golden Horseshoe, you have an option of three meters or 1.2 meters. So the minimum is one point, the minimum would be 1.2. In the um, other subdivision, we deemed that 1.2 was a problem because the firefighters thought it was too close or if they had to do firefighting. And if they're that close, that the owners in the backyards wouldn't be able to have a fence. And that came in front of the minor variance committee. And that was the two other uh, consultants or planners that sit on my, my committee brought up with that one. 
So I'm bringing that one for consistency because we turned that down in another subdivision. So, so fourthly, uh, uh, seventhly, is basically the road. This is the question that I have. When we do the road allowance that we have 66 feet, so we have 33 feet from the center line, what, how many, what is the parking for vehicles that we need? Do they have to park on the owner's property or are they gonna be parking on the road allowance property? Because in one subdivision, if you do these 33 feet, you end up by being two feet from the garage. So, and there's no parking space and they're parking in the streets. So I wonder if they've done an allotment on where the vehicles are gonna park. Are they gonna be parking on the road allowance or on the property that they own? Like you look at other subdivisions, homes on Ontario Street, they all park on their own property. There's sufficient setback. Or is this a new standard of construction that they do take up the road allowance as part of the built up area where they park their vehicles on the driveway? That's the end of my questions so far. Thank you, Councillor Blanc. Thank you. Blanc. Councillor Rowley. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, only two questions. Uh, the first one, I would like to make a comment uh, as the uh, first caller that, uh, call, or that that spoke regarding the uh, the residents on uh, Raglan Street. Um, as you said, there's going to be septic connect our sewage connections there. How will that impact those that are already living there that don't have? Um, uh, connections to the uh, municipal uh, services there. I believe they have water, but there are several that um, are still just on septic. And I believe the reason was because the land is too low for any kind of uh, gravity feed for those people. So I, I would just I would just like that question answered as far as the concern for how, how they can mitigate that. My second question uh, has to do with um, when I'm looking at the map, Street D, the cul-de-sac, um, I know uh, in the last little while, we have kind of gotten rid of a few cul-de-sacs. Uh, once again, some of them are pretty small. I'm just wondering if Public Works will have an opportunity to look at that to make sure that uh, for maintenance reasons, specifically snow, that these cul-de-sacs to meet um, a bigger standard than some of the ones that have previously been constructed at Brighton. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Um, great questions by my fellow council colleagues. I'm anxious to hear those answers as well. Um, the question I ask is, uh, whenever we do any kind of new development, um, there's concern about water and wastewater. And I know with a lot of these developments, I know this one has been in process for a long time. Um, those things are already um, considered in advance. I just want to hear uh, that so it's very clear uh, whether there is capacity for those um, for both water and wastewater in a development like this so that we can reassure um, the rest of, of Brighton that, uh, that we're okay. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Bateman. Yeah, there you go. There we go. Uh, I had several questions, but most of them have been answered. I'll start with the one. The, the proponent part of this where it says it's a condominium, is it going to be similar to that other proposed development that we've been looking at where the developer is responsible for the clearing of the streets? Or is this a different type of condo development where the municipality will be responsible for the maintaining the clearing of those streets? I, that can go back to staff or whatever. The other question I had is, when I look at the lower trend report under 3.9.11, where it talks about significant wildlife habitat, uh, Councillor LeBlanc touched on this. It indicates in there that, you know, the wildlife habitat areas within the municipality have not yet been identified. And prior to the next municipal comprehensive, comprehensive review of this plan, the municipality will work with the MNR to identify significant wildlife habitat but the two things that Councillor LeBlanc mentioned wouldn't fall under either Lower Trent or the MNR. Both have now been transferred to the MECP. So when we look at this, it talks about the council shall require the development proponents to undertake studies completed by a qualified professional. So I'm just looking for clarification on 
who would be the qualified professional since it, when we're talking about either protected species or at risk species that does not fall under the jurisdiction any longer of MNR or LTC you'd have to go with the MECP is that who we'd be getting this from because this isn't just looking for wildlife they've it's been mentioned that both protected and at risk species Are those your questions, Councillor Bateman? Uh, yes, please. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Anderson. Excuse me. Thank you. Uh, Mayor, my concern is also about, uh, I've heard comments about water pressure. Uh, water pressure can be affected by an, all kinds of things. It could be right from the res uh, residents of themselves having problems with their system, but uh, that is a lot of homeschooling in that area. Uh, I'd like to make sure that uh, that isn't going to be an area of concern, uh, along with the uh, items that uh, Dr. Uh, Councillor LeBlanc was talking about, too, is the, uh, you know, where's all this water, the stormwater going to go, and things like that. So I think we need to really focus, again, on the water issues. Uh, the next one is on traffic on Ontario Street. I don't think it's going to be... Uh, a large concern, but Ontario Street is probably more our responsibility, so it's not going to be fair to discuss that tonight, but this will affect that, uh, you know, the need for crosswalks, the need for traffic lights at the top of Ontario Street, uh, just the flow of traffic in that area. So um, it should all be looked at, sidewalks, safety, all those things be addressed at the same time or even before this all happens. And then the other item was, uh, again, the size of the lots I'm concerned about. Uh, where Are they going to be parking on the streets in the winter? So we have a full-time person uh, handing out tickets because of snow removal. Um, if these properties aren't large enough and the driveways aren't large enough, that's probably what's going to happen. So uh, I think there might be too much density going into this project and not enough green space. So, But that's something maybe when it gets to the site plan a little bit more, we can uh, look at that as well. I do like the couple of changes that, that were presented tonight. Um, I thought I only saw cul-de-sac. I didn't, I didn't, I don't even know if I saw two cul-de-sacs. There was two on the, uh, the one that I got here, but is there only one or is there none on, on this, this photo tonight? Have you got that? Somebody, um, uh, well, they'll, they'll get to it, Ron. Okay, it's their turn to answer. Okay, if, it'd be great if there weren't any cul de sacs. So, yeah, the, 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 the I think the revised uh image shows no cul de sacs, which is actually okay. quite confusing, but okay. we'll let, okay. we'll let Perfect. look at that. Perfect. And, okay, uh, so that's all members of council who have asked their questions except me, and I will uh, just chime in with a couple. I've been able to cross some off my list, thanks to the mem my, my fellow members of council. That's good. Uh, I do want to circle back to Councillor Anderson's question about sidewalks. Although uh, perhaps it is a municipal matter, um, certainly it is because of uh, this level of, uh, of growth that we see the need for more and more sidewalks in the community that may not be part of this subdivision, but may be necessary off, uh, off subdivision for people to be able to um, you know, get downtown and what have you and the concept of possible um, crosswalk uh, along Ontario somewhere. This, uh, this uh, concept has been brought to me a number of times over the course of the last few months uh, of a need for a crosswalk on Ontario um, and, and other places too, but we're specifically dealing with Ontario tonight. So I'll, uh, I'll just leave that with staff and, and the consultants to, to answer if, if those, that's been considered in any way. Um, and uh, I do want to uh, compliment the, the proponents on the mix of and range of product that's uh, being considered here. Uh, this is exactly the kind of thing that will allow for uh, what, what we might loosely call affordability in, in housing development in our community. So uh, it's enthusing to see that happening. So lots of questions there for folks to answer and I will uh, turn the floor over unless there's a I was just going to say, unless there's another member of council, go ahead, Councillor LeBlanc. Yes, uh, I hope I'm muted. I'm not muted. Good. Yes, you're there for the, uh, for the proponent. While I was walking the property on Sunday, I noticed a number of piezometers that were installed. So 
hopefully they've done a year study of the uh, of the groundwater is if if where it is and if they're going to be doing basements uh we want to make sure that they stay above the, the water table so we don't have uh, some of the homes that are on Taylor street in raglan that run three and four sub pumps to keep their basement dry so they can't have them that they they don't go to that depth that they watch what they're doing because it is a floodplain. I lived on that street, 156 Ontario Street, for 18 years, and my back flood, my backyard flooded all the time. But it drains quite well; it's quite sandy. But we do have a lot of flooding there, so I just want to make sure that if you put a basement, you don't end up with multiple sub pumps. So yep. that you stay above the groundwater. Thank you. Any other questions or comments from members of council? Council Rowley. Thank you. Um, just reviewing my notes, I just want to go back. I did uh, see the map with the uh, cul-de-sac eliminated. My apologies for that. I had based my questions on the uh, on attachment two and not on attachment eight. So I see that it's been eliminated. Thank you very much for that. I think it's important that we leave the comment there because the the new the revised version has not been vetted by staff. So I think it's important that um, we we consider both the original mapping and the new mapping. So okay. we're going we're gonna to let your, we're going to let your questions okay. stand just, um, just because just for that. It's okay. Because I, I, I did base it on, uh, on attachment two. Sorry about that, but okay. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Bateman. I, I just want to go back to the traffic and, uh, when we're looking at proposed developments and we're looking at traffic impact studies, and I think we typically look at the impact that that particular development will have, and it might be for Mr. Walsh or the CAO or whoever. We've got a lot of developments that are under consideration right now. Do we at any point say, look down the road or in the crystal ball and look at the impact when all these come together? Like if we look at the, you know, the proposed development on Cedar Street, which will have an impact as well as the other one, because all those streets interconnect and people are trying to, we look at the big picture of all these ones that are coming to the thing instead of just, okay, this development will impact at this, but if we're not factoring the other ones, we're already under consideration by council. Do, at any point, does the municipality look at the overall of what's on the, you know, our docket from months past coming up and stuff for an overall impact to these streets? And I'll, we'll let uh, we'll let staff answer that when it comes time for final comments. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, any other questions or comments from members of council? Are you waving your hand around, Councillor Bateman? No, I'm trying to mute. <laughs> there we go. Okay, uh, Councillor Anderson. Just yeah, I just want to be clear. Uh, the, the last the last phase of this would be the condominiums. That's what I was sort of getting. At this is is that correct? I think the condominiums are, are listed as future uh, considerations. So um, I, we would see phase out in a in a subdivision agreement. But I don't think, and I'm sort of assuming here, and and I'll get I'll I'll get our staff and uh, and consultant and the proponents consultant to chime in when it's their turn. But I, I don't think we would see the condo on a subdivision agreement because we would need a, I think we would need a site plan agreement for that, but um, I'm not, uh, I'm not a planner. So we'll let the planners uh, let us know what the, what, how, how this all rolls out. Fair enough? Yeah, thanks. Final chance members of council before I move on. So Ms. Ferguson Oldhouse, uh, you're up with a lot of answers or perhaps uh, perhaps uh, some comments about how you have to get back to us. I'm not sure. <laughs> Go ahead, Ruth. You're muted, by the way. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I'm, I might ask Amanda Redden to also unmute because there are many of the questions that are engineering related. And of course, many of them would uh, be more appropriately answered by, uh, by the uh, staff or the um, um, planning consultant for the municipality. Um, but uh, I might just start off, and, and I do apologize for uh, the confusion in created by presenting an alternate or a new plan. Um, the reason that we wanted to present the uh, new plan was to do our best efforts to respond to the municipal comments that we received, and, and in doing so, did not want to present a plan that we knew we were going to be altering, and also knowing it's coming back. 
because all of this will be uh, discussed in more detail by the municipal with the municipal staff and, and the other agencies. And there'll be a more detailed submission made and it'll all be coming back to you and to the public. But there are no cul-de-sacs in the new plan. That was one of the, the um, comments that uh, municipal staff made is they, they preferred to have all of the streets connected. And so that is one of the reasons we made um, the revisions was to ensure that that would occur in, in the road network. And one of the other things that staff asked for was a crosswalk to connect this subdivision to the east side of Ontario Street where the sidewalks are already located and to do so at a midpoint. And that's one of the proposed changes that we have added is this central pedestrian connections and crosswalk across Ontario Street. And that way Cardinal Court and the community the neighborhoods on the east side will be connected to the west side, for example, if they wanted to visit the park in the subdivision or visit friends, they would have a way of, of having a pedestrian link to the subdivision that would be very convenient and, and accessible. So that was that is something that is actually um, came out of the staff comments and we've revised the plan to show that. With respect to the condominium, it is at the very uh, northern end of the subdivision and would be developed at the end. Um, it would also be subject to a separate site plan approval um, that would be registered that would define the, the um, details of that uh, development. And, and I know that the um, planning uh, consultant has made recommendations of the zoning that is DM wills uh, that the zoning be deferred until such time as the site plan comes forward for those lands. And they condominium um, in answer to uh, Councillor Bateman is similar to the uh, Cedar Street uh, project in that the internal streets in the condominium are in fact maintained by the condominium corporation. Um, they, they would look after snow removal and all road maintenance. So that, yes, in fact, it is similar. And there's an agreement to ensure that that occurs. Um, there are, uh, of course, sidewalks uh, throughout the, the subdivision that would be um, constructed as part of the roadway. And all of the, in terms of the questions about parking, um, the municipality would decide if parking would be allowed on the street or not. Certainly with a 20 meter road allowance, there is the um, possibility that parking could be provided on street. And that would be subject to the municipal uh, bylaws for parking, um, as well as, as uh, what is approved by the uh, municipal staff. But when we uh, position um, homes on, on lots, and most of the lots in here are 34 meters deep, that's a little deeper than you might find in other subdivisions, I can't say for sure. But there's always a requirement that there be a setback for the um, uh, paved portion of the driveway that is not going to result in overhang on the sidewalks because you don't want to have people who are trying to walk through the subdivision being blocked by cars that overhanging onto the sidewalk. Now that that doesn't mean that people don't block the sidewalks when they have guests come or perhaps they have many cars and they're not parking them in the garage. So this does become a problem in subdivisions. So it's, it's sort of multifaceted in terms of how to accommodate the parking. From, uh, from the homeowners and visitors to the subdivision. So I hope that, hope that answers some of the planning questions. Um, if there's any questions arising out of my response, I'd be happy to answer them. But I think the other questions are almost um, entirely related to engineering. So Amanda, um, did you wanna pick up on, on some of the other questions? Yeah, um, I'll try to go through them one at a time. Um, there was a lot of questions about stormwater management. Um, so one of the first things I'd say is, yes, you're right. There is no pond proposed on this subdivision. Um, we reviewed the report previ previously completed by TSH. It was a 1991 master drainage study. As part of that report, they looked at development of these lands and found that uh, there was no an imperceptible impact to the flood line um, after development of these lands. Jewel repeated that analysis and came to the same conclusions. Uh, therefore, quantity control is redundant in this case and has not been provided. That's why you don't see a pond. Um, so then we look at quality control, um, at which we are providing with uh, at source units and end of pipe units in this case, OGS oil grit separators are proposed for the quality treatment. Um, there were also some statements about 
flooding um, and external flows for stormwater. So all of the um, stormwater runoff from the subdivision would be contained within the subdivision lands, picked up in the storm sewers or directed through the roads, through uh, blocks out to the Western tributary. Any runoff from external lands would be collected in rear yard swales and catch basins connected to the storm sewer system and out to the West tributary as well. Um, regarding, sorry, I'll come back if there was more stormwater questions when I get there, but regarding sanitary sewers. So there's an existing 600 millimeter sanitary sewer on Raglan Street. We're just proposing a short extension. I think it's 20 or 30 meters to get to the entrance of our subdivision up Street A. And then we would extend the gravity sewers up through the subdivision. Um, Uh, we posed the question or to municipal staff early on in the process and municipal staff responded that there were no concerns uh, with treatment capacity or downstream sanitary or water capacity. Uh, regarding the comments about Trillium and Trillium Flex, I don't know the answer to that comment. We would have to go back to our environmental consultant, Asiotis. Um, a water, there was questions about water pressure. We did complete a water model as part of the servicing report. Um, and in that water model found that there was sufficient pressure and flow to support the subdivision. Um, Councillor LeBlanc talked about Pesometers installed on the property, you're absolutely right. We did install monitoring wells on the property to establish long-term uh, high groundwater levels and we will take that into account when establishing basement elevations. I think that was everything. If I've missed anything, feel free to let me know. I'm just gonna go through, um... Go ahead, Ms. Ferguson, I'll have you. Oh, I, was just, I was just going to mention that uh, I did uh, not mention the 1.2 meter uh, side yard setback. And um, Councillor LeBlanc had raised this question about that being um, not acceptable in the municipality. Um, I myself was not, not aware of that. Um, however, this would be a question for the municipal staff uh, or their consultants to respond to. It is a standard side yard setback in most urban areas uh, in this part of the province. So uh, I'm not aware of what the, what the concern might be. What we are always trying to do in a, in a subdivision design like this is to balance the, um, the requirements for intensification that are set out in upper tier plans and as well in the Brighton official plan with um, the local market demands and, and um, in other words, to provide for the density targets that we must. And part of the way of doing that is to um, ensure that there's a sufficient number of, of lots being provided and the builders themselves also like to have slightly larger units, particularly because many of the housing units now are bungalows. There's a strong demand for that. And the bungalows just physically take up more space on the lot, as you can appreciate. And, and so that is one of the factors that drives the, the 1.2 meter side yard versus three meters or 40% coverage versus 30% coverage. It's almost all driven by the type of housing product that the builders wanna build. So, um, but balancing that with what the acceptable community standards are. So this would be something that we'd wanna talk further with the municipal staff about to ensure that it is an acceptable standard. Um, but again, the question about density, we're actually um, at, in the low density range overall for the subdivision. And again, having to meet the density targets that are set out in the planning documents. So I think that concludes as much as I'm able to answer some of those questions. Thank you. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask uh, Ms. Doherty to come in and um, maybe pick up some of the um, questions that the municipality should be answering. Uh, specific to traffic and traffic control and, and sewage and water capacity and water modeling. If you're able to. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, some of it's probably a little bit more uh, technical for me as a, a planner and uh, more for an engineer, but I will respond to uh, certainly what I can. 
Um, so I'll just try and go through the, the comments from the beginning. Um, regarding um, the, the individual who asked about being able to find um, additional information, uh, the reports are available on the website, uh, but following the meeting, I, I will follow up with anyone who has submitted comments and um, provide them with that link. It is also available in the report that's on the agenda, but I can certainly send that out um, just for ease of reference for anybody who needs that. Uh, regarding the uh, construction concern, so uh, there will need to be appropriate mitigation measures proposed um, by the proponent, um, but these will be reviewed by staff um, as well as the, the peer review engineers. Um, this is going to become more of a greater point of consideration as we get towards um, the, more of the plan of subdivision application, um, which we're recommending um, the next time that you would see that the official plan amendment and zoning bylaw amendment applications would be at the same time as a public meeting for the, the plan of subdivision. So that will um, be brought forward um, at a future meeting or be more, um, like I said, more of a point of focus at that point of time. Um, but as, uh, as you mentioned, Mr. Mayor, uh, that would form part of an agreement um, that those things would have to be um, considered, um, monitored, implemented. I uh, believe, um, hopefully questions about stormwater management were, um, were addressed. Um, regarding uh, the setback um, to like the 1.2 meter uh, setback, um, this is permitted currently in other um, zone categories as a, an interior side yard setback. Uh, I'm not aware that this has been brought up as a, as a concern, but we can refer that back to the fire chief because that would certainly be uh, more within his purview, but we can, we can refer that back. With respect to the uh, significant wildlife um, uh, habitat or species, we do continue to have outstanding concerns with that. Um, I'm not aware that um, drooping trillium specifically has been brought up, but um, there has been comment that there is potential habitat for various uh, species at risk um, that have not necessarily gone through the appropriate field studies to confirm. Um, the appropriate uh, qualified professional uh, to do those studies would be the, the proponent's biologist in this case. Um, MECP uh, would comment in the case where um, any such species at risk have been identified and they would be commenting more with respect to permitting requirements if, if such a species had been identified um, on, the, on the property. Um, but at this point in time, we're not aware that anything specifically has um, been brought up. Um, regarding the, the servicing with uh, water and sewer, um, uh, as Amanda Redden mentioned, their, their reports have indicated enough um, capacity uh, and pressure for water and sewer, um, but we have requested more, the, the peer review engineers have requested more information, um, both for water and um, sewer, uh, just to confirm the conclusions. It's not considered to be a significant concern, um, but, uh, but prior to signing off on those reports in their entirety, there, there is some additional information that's been requested. With respect to traffic, uh, they are required to, or they have included actually as part of their traffic impact study, uh, considerations for future uh, development that's already contemplated in the area. And the, the traffic impact study uh, also plans uh, for growth into what we would call the planning horizon being uh, to 2030. Um, however, again, in that case, um, where they're currently not proposing any change in geometry um, or any uh, turning lanes. Uh, we have requested actually that uh, they provide um, calculations based on what would be considered a higher growth factor for traffic um, than what was provided in the, the traffic impact study. Um, Brighton's growing quickly. Um, there um, has been you know, data out there that suggests that those volumes are growing much faster. And so we've requested something that would represent a more accurate uh, modeling of that um, situation. Uh, and um, for flooding, um, certainly that is a, within homes, um, certainly that is a, a concern. Um, the geotech uh, report will identify an evaluate or a, an elevation, um, which would have to be uh, considered um, to prevent against flooding. Um, the official plan policy 
where this property is located, special policy area number one, also requires that um, any construction take into consideration uh, flood reduction or, or flood uh, damage reduction. Um, and this would all form part of the subdivision agreement as well. So I think that covers everything that um, Ruth and Amanda Redden hadn't already covered. But again, if there's any questions, just uh, please let me know. I think the only thing that I'm noting that wasn't covered is, um, is there any or would there be any mitigation for uh, the septic systems at the, someone said east, but I think it's the west end of Raglan Street. Is there any concern, I think is the, the real question. That is an excellent question, <laughs> Mr. Mayor, um, but I'd have to talk to um, uh, the engineers with that respect. I think that's um, that's not within my, my purview, but we can certainly get back on that. Thank you. And Ms. Doherty, will, will all of this, all of these questions um, be highlighted in a final report when it does come back to council? Yes, they absolutely can be. Yes. I think that would be a good idea for, especially for members of council who have to make this decision at the end of the day, mm -hmm. um, including the two questions that were offered to us by the, the members of the public, um, noting that one of those will be answered in the subdivision agreement with regard to the cleaning and mitigation of dirt on streets. So before, um, before I wrap it up, I was just going to say, are there any final questions from members of council? <laughs> so Councillor LeBlanc first. Thank you, Mayor, uh, for uh, the planner or the engineer on the, uh, on the, OG, on the uh, oil, uh, oil water separators and grid separators that you put in. So uh, F3 and F4s that usually go in there, which are known as uh, strong uh, carcinogens, when you break them down to their compound, are usually in, fine, in a fine particular mass. How are you going to get reduction in flow during cold weather? And if we're adding salt, sand to our road, how often are these going to have to be cleaned and, and uh, basically emptied? And what's the cost going to be to the town? And how are you going to keep the same flow to meet a 100-year study if, it, if, they, if they're not sized correctly, if you look at them. When it comes to water pressure, are you looking at doing pitot tube testing? Basically, you see the fire flow requirements is gonna be maintained that we have for our fire hydrants in that area, if you're gonna do that at the same time. And I like to hear that you're using the pitot tubes and you're gonna bring the basements up so they're not into flooding so we don't have basements flooding so they can finish their basements. The, the third one for the planner is, the question is again, using the road allowance, because in one subdivision, when you measure the 33 feet, you come two feet from the garage. So is it common practice to park the vehicles on the road allowance, or should they be on the, on the property that's owned by the property owner? That is the question that I'm asking. If it's a common practice, I have no problem with it. But if it's only gonna be used here in Brighton, because I've only found it in one subdivision so far that I've measured the road. Thank you. Thank you. And in contemplating that last question, I would uh, remind the planners that uh, in Brighton, one cannot park on the roads between November and April uh, in the whatever, the wee hours of the evening for, for snow, snow removal maintenance. So uh, that has to be mitigated at any, at any point. And I'm sure our staff will be watching for that as well. Uh, Deputy Mayor. Thank you. Um, and I just want to make it clear that uh, I'm not against these sorts of developments. Uh, I think myself and I think the rest of the council, we want to make sure we're getting it right. And that's why we're asking all these questions and making these comments. Um, for me, I just kind of a final comment. It's not a question as far as uh, some of these uh, properties, existing properties that have flooding. And we talk about uh, even just the flow and not needing a pond. I just want to make sure that when we put in a new development, uh, we're not causing any more issues. If anything, we're actually correcting some issues that may already be there. And, uh, and that's my reasoning for, for concern at some point. And I think, like I said, I don't speak for council, but I, I think I know what this council is, is after here. And that's our reasoning for, for going this route and wanting to know the answers to a lot of these questions. So as long as that can be kept in mind, um, you know, going through the process, because I think uh, as Brighton, um, we, we want to do this well. 
uh, this council wants to do this well and see these things done well and 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 that is our purpose so that's all and and quite specifically there are residents along raglan and ontario who've been waiting for this development to roll out so that their um, drainage issues will be solved uh, by this subdivision so um, that is that will be council's anticipation uh, as we as we roll this out that's for certain and councillor anderson you're muted ron Thank you. Uh, I just had a thought uh, before I asked the question about the the residents that are already there. Could they not connect to these uh, services if it's going to run by their door? Like it, I know it might be a cost to them, but would they have the options to to that might mitigate their problems that they're having now too? So um, that's a question, I guess. Could that be done? And the next question is on this. Uh, um, stormwater. I'm, you know, we're all nervous about that. But where's all this stormwater going to go? It's going to go into storm sewers. But where's it going to go? Are we going to be passing it off to a another pond somewhere, or are we where where's this going to go? So we'll get we'll get that answer perhaps. Question. Yeah, perhaps. Sorry, the final, yeah, we'll get that answer either through the final comments this evening or when the report comes back to us. Uh, with the with the subdivision agreement for consideration. Okay. So, Ms. Ferguson Althouse, I will give you an opportunity for final comments. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I will be able to possibly only respond to the question from um, Councillor LeBlanc about uh, the sidewalk and the parking. Um, the other questions, I believe, also would be. Um, best uh, uh, referred over to Amanda Redden um, because they were all engineering related. But with respect, I understand what your suggest what uh, was mentioned that uh, parking on the streets is not allowed during the winter and, and that is understandable for snow removal. But uh, if from the, um, the limits of the road allowance, uh, the 10 meter or from center line, if you will, um, includes the sidewalk and an offset from the sidewalk towards the home uh, perhaps for utilities. There's a, a, a typical cross section that the municipal subdivision agreement sets out for the roadway design, which includes utilities, sidewalks, street trees, all of those sorts of things. Well, then the property line starts and from the property line to the dwelling, the minimum setback for the driveway is six meters. So there is a minimum requirement for at least a single car to park in that driveway and then there's always a, an attached garage with the home. I'm not sure how else I can answer the question beyond that in that that is the typical um, layout of the homes within the subdivision. Certainly there's a, at least the minimum space for to park a single car in the driveway. It's a requirement in the Brighton zoning bylaw as I recall. Amanda, are you able to answer the other questions? Yeah, so I'll start with stormwater first. Um, just to reiterate, so the storm sewers throughout the development will capture what we call the minor flows from the smaller storm events. Any of the larger storm events or major flows, as is typical, will flow over the roads and be conveyed. Um, everything, the storm sewers and the overland flow all gets conveyed out to the west towards that unnamed tributary and wetland area. Um, it is treated before it gets outletted to that western area with the oil grit separators, um, which Councillor LeBlanc had some questions about. So um, I would note that the oil grit separators are a recommended method of treatment in the um, 2019 stormwater master plan. So we are following recommendations in that report with this proposal. Um, maintenance for the oil grit separators is performed with a vac truck. Uh, they have access ports like a manhole lid on the top and you open it up, the vac truck goes in and sucks out the sediment. In between, you can go in and perform what they call like sludge depth um, measurements to check the depth of the sludge to see if it needs to be uh, vacked out or not at that point. So maintenance is fairly simple. I think it's maybe $6,000, I think, to rent a vac truck for a day. 
Um, in terms of water pressure, I think you were asking, um, we did perform hydrant tests um, or we received hydrant test information from the municipality. No, nope. sorry. We performed, we had a third party perform hydrant testing in this area. We used those results to calibrate our model that we completed for, to analyze the water pressure and flows that would be available for the proposed subdivision. Um, the existing property flooding. So again, all of the storm water runoff from the subdivision, from the new houses, from the streets, all of it will be contained within the subdivision lands. Uh, there will be swales along exterior property lines to capture drainage, both from the external lands and from the backyards in the subdivision, contain it in the swales and convey it into the storm sewer system and out to that Western tributary, which is our ultimate outlet point for these lands. Um, regarding sanitary sewer on Raglan Street, um, yeah, that would probably be a question for the town to address as well, but um, the sanitary sewer exists on Raglan Street and will be extended to the subdivision lands um, to service them. Sometimes the town offers an opportunity for the existing residents to connect. Um, I heard mention of them being too shallow, in which case they may have to consider pumping if they were going to connect here, but we have not investigated that as part of our work on the subdivision lands. I think that was everything. Ms. Ferguson Althouse, any, anything further? No, thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Doherty, any final comments? Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, only just to um, uh, indicate that we did, following uh, the publication of the report to the agenda, we did receive some additional public um, comments, which I believe council does have, um, but those uh, individuals do not opt to speak um, tonight at tonight's meeting. Um, I can name them for the record if you'd like. However, um, their questions or concerns will also be addressed at a, in a future report as well. So their, their, um, their information and their questions and answers will be uh, part and parcel of your final report when it comes back to council? Correct, yes. Um, however, uh, those letters will be, are actually most of them have been provided already to um, to Ruth. Um, I believe there is one that I received uh, later today that has not been circulated to her yet, so she will receive that to address as well. Um, and where appropriate, there are some um, follow up that we can do um, following the meeting as well to those people. Thank you. Quick, quick question from Councillor Bateman, I think. Uh, I'm not sure if this is for Mr. Mr. Walsh. I, I sent some questions earlier today. I just wanted to do a follow up and if it can come back. I had uh, submitted a question regarding the fill management because there's already been a significant amount of soil moved to that site. And instead of you, you fill management plan will be submitted before the final acceptance. Do you know what timeline that is? Just so I know, because I understand, because we've heard tonight about at-risk species and other things that have come up. With the soil that's already been there, has that impacted anything already or would we know? Mr. Walsh? Uh, through the mayor to uh, Council Bateman. Um, the Conservation Authority has been active in reviewing the deposited fill on the site and have uh, approved uh, the deposit of fill within the regulated areas. I recognize there is some fill also deposited outside of the regulated areas and we have received a, a fill application as per our fill um, bylaw. Um, some of the information outstanding for that application, so it hasn't been fully processed, but uh, the, um, the other matter of a fill management plan, some of the municipal staff comments to the, to the most recent submission is to have a, a fill management plan as likely as a, a draft uh, condition of approval, so that we can see what the existing grades are in relation to the final grades and uh, we can then have a good estimate of the total amount of fill that would be going on. There may be some cut fill on site. I know it's rather flat in there, but there might be some opportunity for cut fill, so it may not be uh, as straightforward. There will have to be some, some estimates, some calculations that are taken to determine the total amount of imported fill that uh, is necessary to, to achieve the final elevations in accordance with the finally approved uh, grading and drainage plan. 
So there's still a lot of design work before we know what amount of fill would be permitted on site. But we'll, we'll know that before final approval? Uh, yes, before final approval, Mayor, we'll have uh, probably have uh, a schedule attached to the subdivision agreement uh, for addressing that. Thank you. Does that answer your question, Councilor Bateman? Yeah, it does. I just want to echo, and I think is what the, uh, the deputy mayor had said. Uh, the, my questions just revolve. I want to make sure that we're doing things right because it, it, it looks like a good thing as long as we're, we, we have to make sure that you know, it's right. And, Thank you. I think uh, I think everyone would agree with that. Those statements um, right there. So knowing that the uh, final paragraph of the motion will be asking us to return this to staff for a more fulsome uh, report that will include a subdivision agreement. I will ask if council is ready to make a decision this evening. Noting that the decision is to return it to staff. <laughs> I'll need a mover that council receives the report prepared by the municipal planning consultants regarding applications for an official plan amendment and zoning bylaw amendment for, lo for lands located in part of lots three and four concession one west of Ontario Street in the municipality of Brighton. And that council refer applications OPA 01 2019 and Z 21 2019 back to staff in order to assess comments received at the public meeting and to permit further discussion between the applicant and staff for further assessment of the outstanding issues. And that council direct that applications OPA 01 2019 and Z 21 2019 be returned to council concurrently with file number sub 2019-003 at such time as the application for plan of subdivision as it relates to the subject lands proceeds to a statutory public meeting. Is there a mover? I'll make a motion. Moved by Councillor Rowley and seconded by Councillor Anderson. I will open the floor for further discussion. If there's none noted. Madam Clerk, please call the vote. Members of Council, please unmute yourself. Councillor Ron Anderson? Yes. Councillor Mark Bateman? Yes. Councillor Doug LeBlanc? Yes. Councillor Emily Rowley? Yes. Councillor Mary Tad Mosry? Mary is conflict. Deputy Mayor Laura Vink? Uh, I see. Yes. <laughs> Mayor Brian Ostrander? Yes. And it's carried. Thank you. The second item in our statutory public meeting is to request the decision of council on a zoning bylaw amendment for the following application being Z12 2020. The owner is Paul Quick and it is uh, located at part of lots 23 and 24 concession A part 1, 2, 4 to 7 of plan 38R 1434 868 Smith Street. And Mr. Tai, by what method and on what date was notice of this zoning bylaw amendment application given? Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, notice was given by first class prepaid mail, January 18th, 2021, to all property owners within 120 meters of the property. Notice was also circulated to all agencies as required uh, under the regulations of the Planning Act. In addition, a sign was posted on the property. Thank you, Mr. Tai. Would you please explain the purpose and reason for the proposed zoning bylaw amendment and what it would accomplish? The purpose and effect of the proposed zoning bylaw amendment is to amend the zoning on the subject property from future development to environmental protection in order to protect Smithfield Creek in the existing field verified wetland that exists on the property, as well as to uh, change the zoning from future development to Hamlet Residential uh, Exception 15 in order to permit the development of a single family dwelling and recognize the deficiency in frontage. Thank you, Mr. Tai. And does the owner wish to make any comments? I'm assuming Paul's iPhone is Mr. Quick. Or is that, is that Mr. Coombs? Maybe that's Mr. Coombs. Um, so Madam Clerk. Hello. Mr. Deputy Clerk, are you aware if Mr. Quick is on the line with us? No, I did not. I didn't. No. Well, 
Are there persons present who have questions or comments regarding with the proposed zoning bylaw amendment application? Are the clerk or deputy clerk aware of anyone joining us for that purpose? No? no. Any questions or comments regarding the proposed zoning bylaw amendment for members of council? Councilor LeBlanc. Yes, the mayor, for uh, Daryl, is this for just one lot? Because I walked the entire property, it's quite large, and apparently there used to be an old mill on the property, which was quite significant. And then I found out in history that basically uh, there's been a number of mills on that stream, especially the one on White's Road. But uh, I have no problem with it. Thank you. So round, roundabout way of getting to a question there, Mr. Tai, uh, is this just for one lot? Uh, through through the chair, the the property is a total of four point eight acres. Uh, uh, of course, it's uh, bisected by the, the the creek or the stream, which does generate uh, together with the wetland does generate quite a quite a hefty uh, setback. So, in fact, the developable portion of the property is uh, just in from uh, Smith Street. It uh, was previously, uh, according to the application was previously occupied by a single detached dwelling, which was lost in, in a fire. So essentially this application subject to council's approval is to restore the property to uh, a form of land use that once existed on the property. Thank you, Councillor Anderson. Uh, thank you. I just saw a note just recently about a neighbor concerned about property line, something to do with trees. Candice, did you have anything on that? It was it was uh, it was a question about the survey and if the survey markers will be returned. Is that the correspondence? Yeah, that yeah. Uh, um, will, that, will that be addressed, Mr. Tai? Uh, through the chair, I, I'm not immediately familiar with the, uh, those concerns if they were expressed. However, uh, the property owner. Uh, developer will need to um, satisfactorily establish the lot lines in order for the municipality to be able to confirm the, pro the proper required setbacks from those lot lines to the satisfaction know, just, of the building for the neighbor i just wanted to bring that up because i i can see what their concerns are so long as there's some clear markings and there's no dispute later it's something to do with uh, old trees so anyhow that's all i know certainly mr mayor we, we can undertake to uh investigate that further if council wishes uh, i think you have a letter somewhere i saw it something we got a copy in our email there is a letter the only the only thing council will need to wrap its head around is if it's willing to proceed um knowing knowing that there's a question from from the neighbor with regard to the question was specifically with regard to uh, the returning of um, of uh, proper survey markers. Yeah. Iron iron survey markers. Uh, I guess they're, I'm reading into the letter without you know reading between the lines. It sounds like maybe they've been removed at some point. Yeah, uh, because that lot has been. Uh more or less landscaped and ready to build on now. Uh, at that time, maybe that something happened, yeah. And that, through the chair, that could be confirmed at the building permit stage. Okay. Anything else from members of council? I don't think the owner or applicant has, re has popped in since we first asked, but I will ask Officially, if the owner wishes to make any final comments. Mr. Ty, do you have any final comments? Nothing further, Your Worship. Thank you. Does council wish to make a decision with regard to the zoning bylaw amendment this evening? Yes. The motion reads that council receives the report regarding rezoning applications at 12 2020 as prepared by the municipal planning consultants. And the council approved the zoning bylaw amendment application to rezone certain lands located in part of lots 23 and 24, concession A, parts 1, 2, 4 to 7, of registered plan 38R, 1434, 868 Smith Street, in the municipality of Brighton from future development zone to environmental protection zone, 
and from future development zone to Hamlet residential exception number 15 zone. Is there a mover? Moved by Councillor LeBlanc, seconded by Councillor Anderson. Is there any further discussion? Members of council, please unmute yourself. Madam Clerk, please call the vote. Councillor Ron Anderson? Yes. Councillor Mark Bateman? Yes. Councillor Doug LeBlanc? Yes. Councillor Emily Rowley? Yes. Deputy Mayor Laura Vink? Yes. Mayor Brian Ostrander? Yes. Carried. Thank you. And the um, next item in our statutory public meeting is with regard to a zoning bylaw amendment and consent for the following applications being B11 2020 and Z10 2020. The owner is Michael Vandertorn. The applicant is Spencer Hutchinson. The location is part lot 28 concession A, part one registered plan 39R9717 and part one registered plan 39R14108-15580 County Road 2. Ms. Doherty, what, by what method and on what date was notice of this consent application and zoning bylaw amendment application given? Notice of the application. Sorry, Amanda, I need to make sure that uh, Councillor Tadman's with us in the meeting. Oh. I seen her coming in. Okay. Well, I was reading. <laughs> yes. It, it seemed like she was there. Um, It looks like her screen is on and I see some movement in the background. Councillor Tadman, are you there? There she is. <laughs> Just okay. making sure you're with us, Councillor Tadman, so we can carry well, on. Well, probably uh, I'm so bored by now. Let's get on with this. Uh, Councillor Tadman, always nice to have you. Ms. Doherty, you go right ahead. <laughs> Sent by first class mail on January 18th, 2021 to all property owners within 120 meters of the subject property. A notice was also circulated to all the agencies as required under the Planning Act. And in addition, a signed notice was posted on the property. Thank you, Ms. Doherty. Would you also please explain the purpose and reason for the proposed consent and zoning bylaw amendment and what it would accomplish? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, the purpose of the proposed consent is to sever the existing buildings uh, from the larger retained parcel. Uh, the severance, in effect, would permit the vacant retained lands to be developed for residential and accessory uses. Uh, each of the severed and retained lots would provide for approximately the following. So the Severed lot with the existing buildings would have a lot frontage of 83.9 meters and a lot area of 1.9 hectares. The retained larger uh, parcel, which is currently vacant, would have a lot frontage of 64.2 meters and a lot area of 11 hectares. The zoning bylaw amendment would amend the zoning on the severed lands from rule exception number 32 um, to rule residential zone in its entirety, while the zoning on the retained lands would be from rural zone and rural exception 32 zone to rural exception 32 zone and environmental protection. And this is in order to maintain the rural uses on the retained land as permitted, as well as protecting environmental features. Thank you, Ms. Doherty. Uh, does the owner or applicant wish to make any comments? Uh, sorry, I'm just trying to break through technology here. There you are. Sorry about that. Um, I'm Spencer Hutchison. I'm the applicant and, and the owner is online as well. Uh, we're here just to answer questions if they come up. Uh, we support and accept the recommendations in the report that was pre prepared by your consultants. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Hutchison. Are there persons present who have questions or comments regarding the proposed consent and zoning bylaw amendment applications? Madam Clerk, are you aware of any who have joined us for that purpose? No, I have been, I have received a request through the clerk's office to read a letter 
The letter is from Rebecca LeBlanc and it is to the municipality of Brighton. In regards to the application submitted to the municipality of Brighton for a proposed consent and zoning bylaw amendment for rule number 14082060400-02500 located at part lot 28 concession A, part one at 15580 County Road 2, I wish to oppose this amendment based on the following concerns. This property has two seasonal streams running through it as well as two springs. How would rezoning this to RR zone impact this fresh water supply for nearby properties and drainage? These cold water springs have a connection running all the way through to Lake Ontario. How may this rezoning alter this flow? This property is prime farmland and has been for over 100 years. It is currently being farmed and has been for over 14 years. There is a shortage on the requirement of appropriate road frontage that the municipality requires. How was a judgment made in regard to a lack of road frontage for the building department? Historically, there was a cider mill and cellar. Does this have historic value to the municipality of Brighton? There was also an apple orchard that existed on the property for over 75 years. Has a species at risk assessment been completed? For example, nesting Bobo Link frequent the properties surrounding this lot. They are fairly recent addition to the bird population in the area. And this bird is currently a threatened species according to the Ministry of Environment. On the west bank of the ravine, there is a potential landfill. Has this been reviewed? I wish these concerns to be considered during the discussions surrounding this requested amendment at the municipal meeting scheduled for February 8th. Thank you, Rebecca LeBlanc, 15598 County Road 2 in Brighton. And there being no one else present to ask questions or make comments from the public, I'll open the floor to members of council for questions or comments with regarding the consents and zoning bylaw amendment. Members of council. Councilor Tadman. Thank you, Mayor. Um, just uh, briefly, because I've gone over uh, what uh, Rebecca LeBlanc sent, and I think most of what well, uh, quite a bit of what she brought up has been answered by Laura Trent as far as the streams and other things like that. So I'm not going to bore people with asking the same questions that have already been answered. But as we recall those that saw, maybe nobody, yeah, I think you were uh, mayor, but anyways, um, in the past, there was a, a proposal to uh, to put a max milk at the corner of Elizabeth and Prince Edward Street, and for the longest time it was held up by a chimney swift, which is a a, a bird that also was a, a, at risk, a species at risk, and it's brought up here, which I never knew that there was such a bird as a bobolink, but because of COVID, I've got quite quite a bird watcher lately since I'm housebound and uh, I don't know how that is looked after but I did do some research on it and I think it basically is that you don't cut the hay around there because they they uh, nest on the ground so would that be more looked after when the actual building permit is placed and maybe Mr. Ty could answer that. Well, we'll let, we'll let Ms. Doherty answer that in her final comments when- those Okay, fine. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Anderson, you had a question or comment? Uh, I think it was covered, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions or comments from members of council? Councillor Bateman? You're muted, Mark. I'm sure like everyone else, they've reviewed this file like they do everyone and all the questions were answered for myself from Lower Trent. I even looked into the at-risk species, uh, contacted the MNR and the MECP and they didn't seem to have any concerns when I reached out to them. On the frontage part that's in the letter from Becky LeBlanc, where it said there wasn't enough frontage, when I have... Uh, talk to the applicant, everything seemed to be in order. I think, and I'm not gonna speak for anybody else, but the confusion might have been in a letter that was circulated to residents in the area, the one line in the letter stated the existing 
or recognizing reduced lot frontage. I think that might have been interpreted for not having enough frontage because in my conversations, there is the frontage. So I don't know what that verbiage in that letter meant. Maybe that's where the confusion lied on the lays and not having enough frontage because it said recognizing reduced lot frontage. I don't know what that meant in the letter. I don't know if anybody could speak to that. I see, I see Ms. Doherty is making some notes and we'll speak to it in her final comments as well. Any further questions from members of council or comments? Deputy Mayor? Uh, thank you. Um, and my questions are similar just to we received this letter. I'd like to hear from staff whether these things are concerns, how we go about um, even determining uh, these things with, with any with any lot uh, that we're looking at uh, or is looking at being severed just so that uh, we've uh, covered everything. Uh, from the report that we received, um, there are no concerns from staff and they're suggesting that we grant this. So I just want to make sure that any of these concerns uh, would not change that. Thank you, Mayor. Mr. Rowley, is that your hand up? Uh, no, not really. I just, I just want to concur with all the questions asked. Everything's been asked. There's nothing left for me. Well, uh, Mr. Hutchison, do you have any final comments? I'm not sure if you want to have, want me to answer those questions or that letter or leave them for your your consultant. Um, I believe all the questions have been answered. Um, I would say the draft bylaw that's on your agenda tonight strengthens the environmental protection of this property because if you look at the map with the bylaw, the whole northwest corner of this property is going to be put in an environmental protection zone and the zoning is calling for a buffer so the, the highly sensitive land in the, in the Northwest and where the water course is are gonna be zoned out of development and with a buffer. Um, as with the, the Bob link, um, again, all the development would be in the field. Uh, we're, we're, we're in the, whatever use is gonna be there or a house or, or, or um, fields for horses, it's all in the fields and the, you know, they co coincide with, with wildlife and whatever and uh, you know bobolinks would probably be around the edge of the field rather than dead center of the field um, and as for the frontage um, the frontage of this property is in the bylaws I believe 64 meters uh, which is greater um, frontage than the RU7 zone which is immediately east of this property uh, the property owned by the lady who wrote the letter her, her frontage has special zoning for 60 meters. So you have a property with 60 meters adjacent to one that we're asking for 64 meters. So I think, you know, we're meeting the intent and, and exceeding by four meters, the abutting zoning. So I think that's all I would have to say, but if there's anything else, I, I'll jump back in. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hutchison. Uh, Ms. Doherty, any final comments, please? Uh, Mr. Mayor. Um, just to sort of quickly summarize, I, I don't think that any of the concerns noted in the, the letter um, change anything with respect to um, suggesting approval for the applications. Uh, with respect to the bubble link or the bubble link, um, they do typically like farm fields, although generally uh, ones that are not um, being actively uh, maintained as an agricultural crop. So there is very low expectation that they would be located uh, on this property. But yes, uh, when uh, at time, such time as there's a building permit, uh, it is a legal requirement that if any of these species or any species at risk is identified at that time that uh, construction must stop and then um, that needs to be dealt with. So that, that does come up at the, the construction phase of things. Um, regarding the reduced lot frontage, so saying reduced lot frontage is the typical uh, phrase that we would use to um, express that the uh, lot is requesting lesser lot frontage than what is currently required by the zoning bylaw. So the rural zone requires a 90 uh, meter frontage, whereas this one is requesting uh, 64.2 meters, so it's less than what the rural zone allows for. Um, however, uh, there are um, historically 
um, established uh, lots and that there have been other amendments that have permitted the uh, uh, properties within the rural zone to have at least 45 meters of frontage or the a minimum of 45 meters of frontage, which is consistent with the minimum required for a rural residential lot. Um, so this again would be consistent with uh, what has been previously uh, permitted, um, certainly doesn't seem to be um, an, a considered an issue. Um, and it also is maintaining its required lot area. So um, I don't see that as being um, a concern at all um, in this case. Um, and I, I think that's all that was specifically brought up. But if there are any other comments in the, the letter that anyone would like me to speak to directly, I absolutely can. Thank you. I would normally move on to ask if council wants to make a decision, but uh, I, if there's other specific questions that are addressed in the letter, I'll, I'll allow those to be asked now. Or would you prefer that we move on to making a decision? Everyone want to make a decision on this? Yeah. So the motion reads that council receives the report regarding consent application B11-2020 and zoning bylaw amendment application Z10-2020 as prepared by the municipal planning consultant and that, can, and that the council of the municipality of Brighton grant provisional consent to application B11-2020 subject to the following conditions. That cash in lieu of parkland in the amount of $500 be paid to the municipality of Brighton that the severed and retained lands be rezoned to the satisfaction of the municipality of Brighton that the geospatial data with respect to the subject lands be submitted to the satisfaction of the municipality of Brighton. That the applicant shall lay out and dedicate by deed to the County of Northumberland a strip of land ensuring 18.25 meters from the center line of County Road 2 along the frontage of the proposed severed and retained parcels for road widening purposes. That all taxes on each of the severed and retained lots be in compliance with municipal requirements prior to the issuance of a certificate of official and that three paper copies and a digital copy of a registrable survey for the severed lot and the appropriate deed transfer be prepared and deposited with the municipal clerk within one year of the granting of consent. That council enacts a bylaw to rezone the severed lands from rural exception number 32 zone to rural residential zone and rezone the retained lands from rural zone to rural exception number 32 zone and environmental protection zone. Is there a mover? Councillor Rowley. Is there a seconder? Councillor Bateman. Is there any further discussion? Members of council, please unmute yourselves. Madam Clerk, please call the vote. Councillor Ron Anderson. Yes. Councillor Mark Bateman. Yes. Councillor Doug LeBlanc. Oh, no, he's no. Got right. Councillor Emily Rowley. Yes. Councillor Mary Tadman. You're muted, Mary. Yeah. Yes. Deputy Mayor Laura Vink. Mayor Brian Ostrander. Yes. Carried. Thank you. And we'll wait a moment while Councillor LeBlanc rejoins us. Thank you, everyone. Have a great evening. Thank you, Spencer. I'll be excusing myself, Mayor. Everyone have a great night. Thank you, Amanda. Take care. Thank you, you too. Doug, are you with us? Okay, here he comes. <clears throat> We do have somebody wanting to speak to this item, Mayor, uh, Chantel. To the um, next item, the hens. Yes. Very well. So the purpose of the next item on our statutory public meeting is to request a decision on a, on a zoning bylaw amendment, specifically the backyard hen provi provision, section 4.41. So Mr. Walsh, uh, we've read your report. Um, that's before council. Do you have anything to add or highlight on this, sir? Uh, to the mayor, no, there's nothing in particular to highlight necessarily. There wasn't a, a great deal of response from the uh, the public uh, notification in the newspaper that was given. Uh, there was one one question that was asked of uh, asked of me, and that was to deal with the phrase in section three, item two, regarding 
uh, Brighton by the Bay, Covenant, and um, I think maybe some revised wording, some very minor, minor, simple revised wording, if council would so consider it, is to uh, uh, remove that uh, wording of, about, about in the um, in the Brighton by the Bay development to where developers covenant, co covenant um, has been uh, entered into with the landowner to the contrary, in which case the terms of the covenant shall prevail. Would we, um, if that was the case, would we simply amend this motion to read uh, as amended? Yes, please. All right. So if council is agreeable to that, that's what we'll do. Uh, so, Ms. Gauthier, I think you're the only person present who has a comment or question, so I will turn the floor over to you. Uh, thank you. I just wanted to be um, made aware of any changes that were going to be made, that's all. <laughs> thank you. It sounds like the only change we'll make is to, uh, is to um, ensure that the, the covenants within Brighton by the Bay are, are held to, which means no... Uh, no hens in Brighton by the Bay. Thank you. That sounds like what we're doing this evening. Just anyway. roosters. <laughs> uh, any questions from members of council? Councillor Bateman. More of a comment than a question. I just want to thank Paul because I actually sent that question and I just thought it was better if we called covered all developments that may or may not have a covenant instead of just singling one out. The only thing I was going to ask, Paul, if you could, because I've had some, I probably had more questions on this or as many as I did on the Ontario Street development. If you could just touch on for, for myself or anybody that needs to know, or even in the public, is there any areas in the rural area that would not, that would fall under this? Like if their property is a certain size, that sort of stuff. I've had a lot of people asking, is this going to impact us? And they live in the rural area and they weren't sure based on the size of their property. Uh, sh sure, through the, uh, through, through the mayor to council. Um, no, this pile is really more affecting the urban areas and the smaller lots where the residential zones don't typically permit the keeping of any livestock. So in the rural areas, um, generally you are permitted to keep them livestock if you're in the rural zone. If you're in the rural residential zone, you're also excluded from being able to keep livestock. And now in the rural areas, I think uh, we will now be permitting the keeping of livestock in the rural residential zone as well. And uh, so it's up to the six, maximum of six hens for those who may not be aware of the maximum numbers that are now in the proposed by law. Thank you, Mr. Walsh. Any other comments or questions from members of council? Councillor Tadman. Thank you, Mayor. I, I had a phone call of someone that likes to keep chickens. I'm not going to say that they already have, but anyways, they thought they read some place where they have to be a minimum, minimum of four months old which doesn't make a lot of sense to me, especially if it, you're using as a tool to teach young children. It's kind of nice to raise them from baby chicks, you know, newborns right through. But I can't find that on the bylaw. Is it somewhere? He said it was and I didn't see it. Mr. Walsh, I think I saw it too. Yes, uh, um, to Mayor to Count, so it's in uh, section, um, Roman numeral one, actually. So it's the very first paragraph, having a, a minimum age of four months old. So uh, I think that's really just, um, you know, I, I guess it kind of begged and borrowed from other bylaws. And and uh, so that's, I think really, uh, because we don't really want roosters on a property. So to have have uh, chicks of that age, then you, you're really keeping eggs and, and other things in terms of an operation to, uh, to supply yourself with uh, with the ends. So I think the idea is to make sure that we uh, don't have a full life cycle of production of these hens, that you, you keep it for a specified time frame where it's actually just for eggs. Uh, somewhere around that age, they can begin to uh, 
be available for um, eggs production. So I, I think that uh, that's probably why that number's in there. But I have to admit, I'm, I'm not a poultry farmer, so I don't know all the details. <laughs> I assume you have a follow-up, Councillor Tatman. You go ahead. I do because uh, I re it, it really doesn't make a lot of sense to me that they have to be four months minimum old um, because I know that when people go to purchase baby chicks, they're all sexed and so they know which ones are, are chicken, chicks, female chickens and which one are roosters. So I don't see where the problem is. Councillor Anderson. Uh, I think the bottom line, this is for the production of eggs, uh, not pets and not other uses. Uh, I think it's reasonable to think if you're gonna produce eggs that you, you get a chicken that can produce eggs and, and that you're not developing and producing your own chicks. And, uh, and uh, again, Mary made a good point. It's nice for the kids to see the chicks and, and uh, grow up with that the whole concept but, and, and that's what's being done now for those that are doing it probably but this this is probably in the bylaw it's a it's for egg production so deputy mayor i don't have i like it the way it is anyhow. thank you councillor anderson deputy mayor the idea is that chickens don't start laying eggs till they're about four months old so that's probably why it's worded that way but i understand what councillor tadman is saying because i think locally uh, you get you can go get chicks, uh, not not for producing. Is that if you want chickens, you can go get chicks and raise them to the point where they're laying eggs. Uh, I think that's how uh, I've seen it done around here all the time. People don't go and get four month old chickens from someone. It it just doesn't work that way. Uh, they go get chicks, and, and I think that's why the concern. I don't want to stop anyone from having any. You know, the whole reason why we're doing this is so people can have their backyard hens, and if that's the way it works, then I'm okay with actually changing it. Um, uh, you know, so I can get my chicks tomorrow and start having some eggs in a few months and Mary can come over and we can have breakfast. You're going to need that. Excuse me, Mayor, but could I just comment on that? Because it's not very often that the Deputy Mayor agrees with me. So I'd really like to jump on this. But the other thing about this whole thing, you can have six chicks that are, okay, you buy them at four, four months old and they start laying eggs and each one of them lays one egg a day. So you, in a week, you've got three and a half dozen eggs, but you can't share them with your neighbors. So um, we need to make that clear that uh, Mrs. Vink going to get those chicks cannot share those eggs with me and she can't sell them to me. So I still wanna go back to raise, uh, the whole point of this, I think uh, for families especially is that they wanna see the whole production from baby check to laying the eggs. I did it with my kids. We loved it until they got messy. Mayor, I think um, I'm kind of standing on the shoulders of giants, so to speak. I'm borrowing a lot of uh, research done through other jurisdictions to expedite this. And there is a, if you look into some of the background reporting that was done, in some of the other bylaws of other jurisdictions, you'll see there's a great deal of discussion on, on uh, public health. So to make sure that there aren't any diseases being spread and, and uh, making sure that uh, the, the, the keeping of, of hens at various ages aren't passing different things on. So again, I'm no poultry expert, but I'm just wondering whether that age is in commonly in the bylaws that we're seeing being passed. So it's a, a matter of trying to maintain a healthy population of hens as well and not pass on any poultry related disease. So uh, members of council, I'm gonna ask this question. Uh, you wanna go ahead and pass this um, as is this evening? Do you wanna send it back to staff for a little more research to discover what the, the issue is with four months, et cetera? Or do you wanna make an amendment? Councillor LeBlanc. I would like to see an amendment just to say you can have six chickens, no roosters. Don't put an age on, don't put an age on it. So because you, there, are, there, are, there are already sex at the, at the plant. That you know you're going to get, if you get meters, you always get hens. If you want layers, you always get hens. They already do that. They sort them when, they come, when, they're, when they're born, when they're hatched. So if you said that, then 
you'd have the whole enjoyment of watching them grow and getting them to lay eggs. So I'd like to put an amendment, just say six hens, no roosters, we, we and could take just, out the age. We could just simply strike the last um, half a dozen words from uh, Roman numeral one. So we, were, we would strike each having a minimum age of four months. Yeah. Because the, that line reads, um, legal non-conforming dwelling unit in another zone may keep outside of the dwelling unit a maximum of six hens, period. That's where it would end. Is that what your suggestion? That's what I would suggest, Mayor. Uh, Madam Clerk, should we have a motion to that end? Or if we were to strike that and pass this as amended, because now there's two, two things as amended. Right. Would that, would that work for you? Yes. Very well. So before we go down that road, I want to make sure members of council are okay with this. I don't want to see us defeating something because we, we struck out um, three words. So informally, I just want everyone to tell me if you're comfortable with striking that last section from that paragraph. I'm getting head nods, one, two, three, four. Councillor Anderson? Yeah, um, thank you, Mayor. There must be a reason for this. Uh, I don't know if we, it sounds like, uh, even uh, Mr. Walsh has maybe some concerns. Why is it that uh, other uh, other areas have stuck with the four the four month process? Uh, I'd be interested to know why. And if it's a health matter, or if it's you know, okay, I like to the mayor. To the mayor, I, I did I did correspond with some OMAFRA staff in the drafting of this. I don't believe we spoke specifically to this provision and the number of four months, but I'd be more than happy to do that for the research for council's uh, overall um, satisfaction with the bylaw. So does council wanna, wanna pass this with the amendment? And then if we hear different information, we can always make another amendment to the zoning bylaw. Sure. Add that adds it back in, is that fair enough? I'd like to, fair. yeah, but I'd like to, like to get the answers. Yeah. But Mr. Walsh, you'll, without without providing you with official direction, uh, please do carry out that research because if if there is a health and safety issue, we'd want to know about it, and we want to correct our bylaw if there's a problem. So I'm going to read the motion. I I have another question. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, my question is regarding the covenants, as you spoke. Uh, regarding Brighton by the Bay, is this something that will be maybe um, added to other uh, developments in the future? I'm thinking of condominium developments and things like that. Is this something that will have to be uh, reviewed at those times as well? No, because one of the amendments we're making is to not be specific to Brighton by the Bay. We will just be the bylaw will read that if there are covenants in a subdivision that they those take precedence over the permitting of of, of um, laying hens. Okay, so that will be up to the developers and their covenants, then not up to what we would then regulate, right? That's right. Yeah. Thank you for the clarification. Yeah. Right, now I'm going to read the motion, unless there's another question or comment. The motion reads that council receives a staff report dated February 8th, 2021 regarding a draft zoning bylaw amendment that revises the existing backyard hen provisions of section 4.41 and that council enact the zoning bylaw amendment prepared for this agenda pertaining to section 4.41 comprehensive zoning bylaw number 130, 2019 for the purposes of revising general provisions pertaining to the permitted use of hens on residential properties in quotes backyard hens as amended. And those amendments are with regard to the covenant agreements and with regard to uh, the age of the hens. Is there anything further? Oh, sorry, I'll need a mover. It's moved by Councillor Tadman, seconded by Councillor LeBlanc. I'll open the floor for further discussion. Get cracking. <laughs> <laughs> Members of Council, please unmute yourself. Madam Clerk, please call the vote. Councilor Ron Anderson? Yes. Councilor Mark Bateman? Yes. Councilor Doug LeBlanc? Yes. Councilor Emily Rowley? Yes. Councilor Mary Tadman? Yes. Deputy Mayor Laura Vink? Mayor Brian Ostrander? Yes. It's carried.
Thank you. Our next motion is that council move out of the statutory public meeting February 1st, 2021, 8.50 p.m. Is there a mover? No. Moved by Councillor Bateman, seconded by Councillor Rowley. Is there any discussion? Members of council, please unmute yourselves. Madam Clerk, please call the vote. Councillor Ron Anderson? Yes. Councillor Mark Bateman? Yes. Councillor Doug LeBlanc? Yes. Councillor Emily Rowley? Yes. Councillor Mary Tadman? Yes. Deputy Mayor Laura Vink? Mayor Brian Ostrander? Yes. And it's carried. Thank you. We now move into planning and development reports. Our first report is with regard to the exemption for part lot controls 19 and 20 on plan 39M 929. The applicant is Gordon Toby Developments Limited. Municipal file is PLC 01 2021. Mr. Walsh, we've read your report. Do you have anything to add or highlight? Uh, no, Mayor, I do not. Thank you. The motion before me reads that the report from the planning and development staff dated February 8th, 2021, regarding an application number PLC 01-2021 for exemption of part lot control from Gordon Toby Developments be received, that the application number PLC 01-2021 for exemption from part lot control from lands owned by Gordon Toby Developments, described as blocks 19 and 20 on plan 39M929 be approved, and that a bylaw be enacted as listed on this agenda to exempt lot control from being applied to lands described as blocks 19 and 20 on plan 39M929, more specifically identified through a draft reference as various parts for the purposes of creating freehold lots as follows. Lot one, parts one through seven inclusive. Lot two, parts eight through 11 inclusive. Lot <coughs> two, parts 12 through 14 inclusive. Lots four, parts 15 through 20 inclusive. And that the municipal solicitor be directed to register the enacted bylaw to exempt part lot control including making any necessary revisions to legal descriptions, names, or undertakings as may be necessary for the purposes of registration. Is there a mover? Moved by Councillor Bateman, seconded by Councillor LeBlanc. Is there any discussion? Members of Council, please unmute yourself. Madam Clerk, please call the vote. Councillor Ron Anderson. Yes. Councilor Bateman? Yes. Yes. Councilor Emily Rowley? Yes. Councilor Mary Tadman? Yes. Deputy Mayor Laura Vink? Mayor Brian Ostrander? Yes. And that's carried. Thank you. Uh, planning and development report is with regard to an application for site plan approval from Freedom Mobile. Um, Mr. Ty, we've read this report. Do you have anything to add or highlight? Nothing further, subject to any questions from council. Thank you, Mr. Ty. And the motion before me reads that council receives this report regarding the application for site plan approval. The council resolves to hereby grant site plan approval under section 41 of the Planning Act and further direct staff to forward the site plan agreement to the applicant for execution on the conditions that prior to execution, a, an entrance permit be submitted and approved, including allocation of an, e, um, an E911 civic address and installation of the required marker. And that uh, B, that if required, the property owner lay out and dedicate by deed to the municipality of Brighton, a, stri a strip of land ensuring a minimum of 10 meters from the center line of Telephone Road along the frontage of the property as outlined in section 7.1.2 of the municipality's official plan permitted under section 41 of the planning act and see that the construction cost estimate be updated accordingly and that council enacts a bylaw to authorize the mayor and clerk to execute the site plan agreement following the execution by the applicant is there a mover it's moved by councillor bateman seconded by councillor anderson is there any discussion from members of council Hand up. Yes, I did. Is is this agreement for a, another tower for the 401 or for the use of the public in uh, in Brighton in, in the municipality of Brighton? Mr. Ty, any idea? Through the chair, this is a 
a communications tower to improve cell service, uh, certainly along the, the stretch of the 401 as well as the surrounding area. Councillor Anderson. Yeah, I think that's rather clear, but uh, it mentions about a light not being required on it. It's uh, 70 meters in height and it's a high zone where they're putting it, I think. Uh, does that make sense? Uh, I guess there was a concern about a light on it, but uh, there's not going to be a light on it. Mr. Tye? Again, through the chair, it uh, it, uh, it arose through a, a question on the part of one of the residents who attended the public open house. Uh, the applicant uh, uh, went back to Transport Canada and uh, NAV Canada and both organizations confirmed that there would not be a requirement for any markings or lighting on the tower. Thank you, Councillor LeBlanc. Yes, uh, as a famous councillor once said, I, I'm, I don't have any more ink in my rubber stamp. Uh, was these things, if they're not gonna help out the, um, the rural for broadband and to help out for the internet, and all we're worried about is the traffic going through the 401, I'd like to see, I don't know if we can do anything, but stimulate that they do help out our residents and somehow with broadband and better services. So uh, I have no more ink in my rubber stamp for these because all we've been doing is rubber stamping them. And that's been said by a famous councillor, and that's Mayor, uh, Councillor Tadman that said that. So. Famous, sorry, infamous. Yes. Fair enough. And this is a Freedom Mobile Tower, so anyone uh, wishing to become a Freedom Mobile customer, I assume would... Uh, gain access to their network, be it their cell network or um, internet network, if they have one, I'm, I, I'm not sure. Councillor Bateman. I was just gonna say that uh, Freedom Mobile is a cellular service, so it has nothing to do with uh, bandwidth or broadband in no way, shape or form. But the, uh, the tower in, being in place, it could be used um, on a fee for service basis by other yeah. providers. So um, we would leave that up to the private sector to uh, yeah to go down that road. Uh, Deputy Mayor? That's what I was going to say as well, um, that there's always that opportunity. Also, um, in the day and age that we live, we all have cell phones and we're going to need those towers. And I know Councillor LeBlanc was kind of joking, but uh, I just want to be clear, I don't rubber stamp anything. You're here. Is there anything further from members of Council? Members of Council, please unmute yourselves. <laughs> Madam Clerk, please call the vote. Councillor Ron Anderson? Yes. Councillor Mark Bateman? Yes. Councillor Doug LeBlanc? No. Councillor Emily Rowley? Yes. Councillor Mary Tadman? Yes. Deputy Mayor Laura Vink? Mayor Brian Ostrander? Yes. And it's carried. Thank you. We move into unfinished business. Um, Thank we have you, Council. Here that was at... Sorry, Mr. Ty. Thank you, Council. I'll take my leave uh, if that's okay with you. Thanks, Daryl. Thank you. Have a good night. Good night. Yeah. Moving on to unfinished business, uh, we've added an item legacy planning consent matter. Councilor LeBlanc, I'll give you. Um, 15 seconds here because it shouldn't take much longer than that. We're not going to discuss uh, members of staff, past or present, and we're not going to discuss applications uh, because we don't know if those applicants want them discussed at a council meeting. So um, I'll give you I'll give you your 15 seconds, and then we'll likely uh, put a motion on the floor to refer the matter to staff, and then I'd get you to discuss the matter with staff specifically. Go ahead. Yes. All it is, is that I've been approached by a number of residents that have done applications that basically, in fairness, haven't come in front of council for certain reasons and certain stuff. Some of them that did come in front of council were blocked for certain reasons. But if you look at the reason, it was more what was going on in the, um, in the trend of the council at the time. So all I would like is uh, fairness and get a chance for these people to come back to be heard again and get rid of their frustration and because uh, they need a fair shake. And I explained it to the mayor, the CAO and to the planner. 
And so I was given this 15 minutes to see if council would support it. It was 15 seconds, just by way of information. Yeah. Okay, that's it. I'm done. Uh, Deputy Mayor. I'm still not clear on what Councillor LeBlanc is talking about, and I wouldn't be able to vote regarding anything. Applications, what kind of applications? These were consent applications that I think in some cases uh, did not make it to the council table because okay. of varying issues that have been going on um, um, with um, perhaps our, our, our concerns, our, our staffing concerns that we've had in, in the planning department, present company accepted, but we haven't been able to, we haven't had the staffing levels and there's been people coming and going and consultants taking over uh, where work was being done. And then of course, Mr. Tai um, trying to selling his business and trying to retire uh, other people taking on files. And I think there's some concern that maybe these files haven't come forward or because they didn't come forward in a timely manner, people gave up uh, or maybe even things that might've come to a previous council that were, were not, um, were not looked at favorably that maybe we need to take a second look at. I, did I sort of wrap that up fairly well, Councillor LeBlanc? A lot better than I, <laughs> a lot better than I did, Mayor. Hopefully, I can get the Deputy Mayor on board to for to get this fairness. And if I could talk with her, maybe by phone tomorrow, I can explain it more to her. Sure, uh, Councillor Anderson, you're muted, Ron. Now, now you're muted and gone. <laughs> <laughs> I'm back. Um, you mentioned about it's almost like they can appeal what what had happened before in the past. I'm going to suggest that that's not the case. I think in some of these cases, You're it's a matter of that. the application never got to council for what that, that I'm fine with. Okay. Appeals should be a, a different. Hundred percent. Okay, I would agree. Council Rowley. Thank you, Mayor. I, I also uh, am open to reviewing some of these these kind of things if, if they've kind of slid through the through the cracks. I guess my question is: Is this something like? I mean, there's nothing illegitimate or um, underhanded about doing anything like this. Like, just you know, I as uh, Councillor um, Anderson just said, this isn't an appeal process. This is just to have consideration for those files that have have not been either approved or disapproved for whatever reason, right? Right, so I haven't spoken to the planner or the CAO about this other than very quickly this evening that we, with the CAO, that we were gonna put it on the agenda. But um, I can assure you that Mr. Walsh will not bring anything forward that it should be going to the LPAT for, for appeal. That's not yeah. appropriate. Um, we will only be looking at those items <laughs> um, maybe as you say, fell through the cracks. Right. Right. Okay. So, and this is kind of standard practice then, right? I mean, this isn't, we're not, this isn't a one-off. This is something that would happen, um, you know, in other places in other times. Well, I, I don't know for sure at, at, that this isn't, this, this is a standard practice. Uh, I think in some cases we may have uh, an application that someone's given up on. They've withdrawn it because they didn't feel that it was going fast enough or things were happening in the background. I don't have the fulsome information that Councillor LeBlanc has, so I'm going to ask that we refer the whole matter to staff. We'll get Councillor LeBlanc to talk to staff about the, the, I think there's seven concerns that he has, and we'll get staff to bring forward a report on those that they can bring forward. Right? Fair enough? Councillor Tadman? You're muted, Mary. You're muted, Mary. I've had people come to me with concerns too. So I think the most important thing that, and planning would agree with that, I'm sure, is that people that have been sort of put on the back burner need to be prioritized and get, because they're anxious to get on with what they want to do with their property. So I'm not making, I'm not making a direction or a suggestion even, just knowing that that's what planning will do once they're aware of, of any that haven't been brought to the forefront. So that's that's all I have to say about that. Fair comment. So uh, this will be moved by Councilor LeBlanc and the motion will read that council refer legacy consent matters to staff for a report 
we'll get Councillor LeBlanc to uh, have a conversation with the CAO and the planner about what what those seven issues or so are, and staff will bring forward a report on those files that they can bring forward, uh, or perhaps advise uh, applicants if they need to appeal to the LPAT that that's what they need to do. So the motion is moved by Councillor LeBlanc. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Second. A second by Councillor Tadman. Is there any further discussion? Members of council, please unmute yourself. Madam Clerk, please call the vote. Ron Anderson? Yes. Councilor Mark Bateman? Yes. Councilor Doug LeBlanc? Yes. Councilor Emily Rowley? Yes. Councilor Mary Tadman? Yes. Deputy Mayor Laura Vink? Mayor Brian Ostrander? Yes. And it's carried. Thank you. That takes us into bylaws. The first bylaw is with regard to the quick property in Smithfield. And the motion will read that council gives a bylaw its first, second, and third reading and finally passes on this date. Being a bylaw under the provisions of Section 34 of the Planning Act, RSO 1990, to amend bylaw number 140, 2002, as otherwise amended of the corporation of the municipality of Brighton as it applies to certain lands located on part of lots 23 and 24, concession A being part one, two, four to seven of registered plan 38R 1434, 868 Smith Street in the municipality of Brighton. Is there a mover? I'll move. It's moved by Councillor Anderson, seconded by Councillor Bateman, is there any further discussion on this matter? Those in, oh, sorry. <laughs> Members of council, please unmute yourself. Madam Clerk, please call the vote. Councillor Ron Anderson? Yes. Councillor Mark Bateman? Yes. Councillor Doug LeBlanc? Yes. Councillor Emily Rowley? Yes. Mary has declared. Deputy Mayor Laura Vink? Mayor Brian Ostrander? Yes. And it's carried. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Tadman, you can rejoin us as we move to bylaw with regard to the Vandertorn property on Highway 2. And the motion will read that Council gives a bylaw its first, second, and third reading and finally passes on this date, being a bylaw under the provisions of Section 34 of the Planning Act, RSO 1990, to amend bylaw number 140 2002 as otherwise amended of the Corporation of the Municipality of Brighton as it applies to certain lands located in Part Lot 28, Concession A, Part 1, Registered Plan 39R 9717, and Part 1, Registered Plan 39R 14108 in the Municipality of Brighton. Is there a mover? No mover. Moved by Councillor Anderson. Second by Councillor Rowley. Is there any discussion on this bylaw? Members of council, please unmute yourselves. Madam Clerk, please call the vote. Um, Mr. Street, it would appear that we've lost the clerk. Yep, okay, uh, let me just jump in here. Boy, is she ever frozen. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Councillor Ron Anderson? Yes. Councillor Mark Bateman? Yes. Councillor Rowley? Yes. Councillor Doug LeBlanc? He's declared. Oh. And uh, Councillor Mary Tadman? You're Deputy muted. Mayor Laura Vink? And Mayor Brian Ostrander. Yes. Carried. Thank you. So that takes us into uh, bylaw with regard to the regulation of and the keeping of backyard hens. And the motion reads that council gives a bylaw its first, second, and third reading and finally passes on this date 
being a bylaw to regulate the keeping of backyard hens under the provisions of section 34 of the Planning Act RSO 1990 to amend bylaw number 140 2002 as otherwise amended of the municipality of Brighton as it applies to the whole municipality of Brighton. And Mr. Walsh, should that also read as amended? Yes, please, Mr. Mayor. So I've added as amended to the end of that. And I'll ask for a mover and a seconder, please. It's moved by Councillor Bateman, seconded by Deputy Mayor Vink. Is there any further discussion on this matter? The Deputy Clerk, please call the vote. Councillor Ron Anderson? Yes. Councillor Mark Bateman? Yes. Councillor Doug LeBlanc? Yes. Councillor Emily Rowley? Yes. Councillor Mary Tabman? You're muted still, Mary. Yes. Deputy Mayor Laura Vink. And Mayor Brian Ostrander. Yes. Carried. Thank you. Next bylaws with regard to the exemption from part lot control for Gordon Toby developments. And the motion reads that council gives a bylaw its first, second, and third reading, and finally passes on this date, being a bylaw to exempt Block 19 and Block 20 on plan of subdivision 39M929 from part lot control, section 50, subsection 5 of the Planning Act. Is there a mover? Councillor Rowley and a seconder. Mayor Vink. Any further discussion on this? Members of council, please unmute yourselves. Deputy Clerk, please call the vote. Councillor Ron Anderson? Yes. Councillor Mark Bateman? Yes. Councillor Doug LeBlanc? Yes. Councillor Emily Rowley? Yes. Councillor Mary Tadman? Yes. Deputy Mayor Laura Vink? and Mayor Brian Ostrander. Yes. Carry. Thank you. Next bylaw is with regard to the authorization of a site plan agreement for Freedom Mobile. And the motion reads that council gives a bylaw, it's first, second and third reading and finally passes on this date. Being a bylaw to authorize the mayor and clerk to execute an agreement between the corporation of the municipality of Brighton and Freedom Mobile incorporated regarding a telecommunications tower on the property located in part of lots nine and 10 concession three in the municipality of Brighton in the county of Northumberland. Is there a mover? Oh. <laughs> it's moved by Councillor Rowley, seconded by Councillor Anderson. We didn't know what you're waiting for. <laughs> Is there any discussion? Members of council, please unmute yourselves. Deputy clerk, please call the vote. Councillor Ron Anderson. Yes. Councillor Mark Bateman. Yes. Councillor Doug LeBlanc. No. Councillor Emily Rowley. Sorry, yes. Councillor Mary Tadman. Yes. Deputy Mayor Laura Vink and Mayor Brian Ostrander. Yes. Carried. Thank you. So we move into question period. Uh, Deputy Clerk, are you aware of anyone um, who may wish to join us to ask a question this evening? Uh, no, I have not received any requests. Thank you. So for the public who are viewing us, we will read a motion that resolves ourselves into closed session and uh, we will take a 10 minute recess, but the rest of the meeting will carry on uh, and will not be displayed on YouTube. So the motion reads that council resolve itself into closed session, February 8th, 2021 at 9.15 p.m. 
Pursuant to the Ontario Municipal Act 2001 as amended subsection 239-2F, advice that is subject to solicitor client privilege, Brighton and Lake Ontario flooding. Is there a mover? It's moved by Councillor Rowley. Seconded by Councillor Bateman. Is there any discussion? Members of council, please unmute yourselves. Deputy Clerk, please call the vote. Councillor Ron Anderson? Yes. Councillor Mark Bateman? Yes. Councillor Doug LeBlanc? Yes. Councillor Emily Rowley? Yes. <clears throat> Councillor Mary Tadman? Yes. Deputy Mayor Laura Vink? And Mayor Brian Ostrander? Yes. Carried. Thank you all. We'll take a 10 minute recess and meet back here at 920, not here. We'll meet back at the closed session link at 925 p.m. Um, is everyone joining us? Paul